finished town meeting last week in uh, just three sessions. Um, tonight we have a number of things on our agenda. The first timed item is at 6.45 and that is our property tax classification hearing. Uh, in the meantime, we have public comment and then other things we might tend to. So is anyone here for public comment? Ms. Pro, please come forward and introduce yourself to the folks at home. I'm Melissa Perot from Precinct One. And first of all, I want to thank the Select Board su for supporting our Article 19. And we're very hopeful that this will begin to have some, some change, although we're not uh, expecting a dramatic change. Fortunately, we are entering the, the quiet time of year. Um, but going forward from that, I'd like to ask, what is the process for developing the uh, schedule of costs? So we don't, actually, costs. we don't actually deal with uh, questions during oh, you public don't? comments. So okay. you can just put to us that okay. you would I like am concerned okay. <laughs> that we have a process for developing the response costs schedule, or whatever you call it. And, um, and also to um, a, a request that the letters that go out We've had a request from some people who would like that to be pretty specific about the date, the time, the people involved, and the offenses that were uh, contributed to the letter so that they can take the appropriate actions. It wouldn't be enough just to have a letter saying you've had a nuisance response at such and such an address in their view. So I don't know what has been in the letters and but that's just a request that they be fairly specific. And um, I guess my last one is a question, so I shan't ask it. Ask it. So thank you. Okay, thank you very much for coming in and uh, expressing your concerns to us. Anyone else have anything for public comment? Okay, then we will deal with a couple of untimed items. And the first one we will do is the annual proclamation for Human Rights Day. And we have Deb Bradway here, who is the Human Resources and Human Rights Director. and She's going to tell us about this year's plans. Welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, before you, you have a request to declare December 10th uh, International Human Rights Day in the town of Amherst. And it's the 64th anniversary of the Declaration of Human Rights on December 10th. And the Human Rights Commission would like to invite the greater Amherst community to its annual vigil on the town common at 6 p.m. for a community reading of the International Declaration of Human Rights. If you've ever read it, imagine reading it, a body of people reading it out loud. Its meaning takes on greater dimension when you have a, a body of people each sharing the reading of it. And uh, we invite everybody to come by candlelight, bring a flashlight or a candle, and celebrate the International Declaration of Human Rights. And the Human Rights Commission does request that you issue the proclamation in front of you. Thank you very much. Does anyone have questions or comments about this? Ms. Stein. Two. First, could we have the volume upped because I'm having trouble hearing? Oh. And the second thing is, did you say what day? Can you remind us the day? It's Monday, December 10th, 2012, 6 p.m. on the Amherst Town Common. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Ms. Stein, would you like to make the motion? I move that the select board proclaim December 10th, 2012 as Human Rights Day in Amherst and encourage all Amherst citizens to be mindful of human rights principles and urge all municipal, state, federal, and international bodies to incorporate said principles into their laws and policies as a means to move toward the creation of a human rights culture, which is a, quote, lived awareness, end quote, of human rights principles. Second. Further discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you very much. Thank do you. you. Do you happen to know how uh, many years Amherst has been declaring this? I don't. That's okay. <laughs> I was just curious. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Baruch. Well, um, 
comments. Please speak into your mic. That, I assume that it will go on the website with um, some information about how to attend. Yes, it will. As opposed to just being in the select board minutes. That's great. Great. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you. All right. Next up, we have, uh, oh, let's do finally the approval of the FY12 Select Board Annual Report. I've been putting it on the agenda every week as pressure to myself to try and get the darn thing done. Finally have, I appreciate your patience. Um, so you have the draft of that Select Board Report in your packets this month, and of course, as usual, everything is on our website. Um, so questions or comments about the draft of the report. Ms. Stein. I thought it was an excellent, excellent report. I would make only one suggestion and that is uh, under the section on the last page of the minutes, I would say that uh, I would like to add Mr. Musanti's name to it as having facilitated um, this new procedure, which is working so well, as well as the great work of Deborah Roussel. Happy to do that. Anyone else have anything to add or subtract? Ms. Brewer. This is just one of the many things we're grateful for you to you for doing because it would be way more work for the rest of us because we wouldn't keep we don't keep nearly as comprehensive of notes and it's still a lot of work for you to do so thank you for doing it on our behalf. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. All right, uh, then we need a vote to approve the report as amended. I move that this <coughs> excuse me. I move that the select board accept the FY12 annual report for the select board as presented by Chair Stephanie O'Keefe. <coughs> With a similar amount of gratitude, I second. Further discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Thank you. All right. Next up, we have renewal of annual licenses. Um, this is, of course, the time of year when we renew all of our licenses because there are so very many licenses that come under the select board's purview. We're kind of doing them in waves as the office gets them all ready uh, for our approval. Uh, you can imagine there's quite a lot of processing that goes on for each one of those. Um, so this week we are doing just the liquor licenses. Those are all ready for us. There is a sheet on your desk that is just slightly different than the one that had been in your packet there were um, two um, two establishments that had the incorrect license listed for them in the first version that was Amherst Brewing Company and Amherst Wines and Spirits um, one business had inadvertently been left off the first version that was Edible Adams which is Shea Albert and um, there's just been a slight revision in how the information is pre presented on Hickory Ridge and everything else is the same. So any questions or comments about that list of license renewals? Ms. Brewer. I appreciate the comments being listed to the side indicating what information is still pending, even though none of us personally are going to do anything about that, and it's up to the office to make sure that comes in. It's, this is the same kind of stuff that we see cause problems for people when we, they submit their original liquor licenses. They don't have all their paperwork taken care of, and workers' comp seems to be a particularly a big issue for people to get finished and who knows if that's partly a state not helping them or maybe it's just a complicated process but there are lots of hoops for people to jump through and it's good that we're keeping track of what those are and we make sure that nothing goes through without it so great work because it's lots of different pieces correct so those are all um, the license fees are all paid as was required by the state as of last Friday um, and none of the licenses obviously will be issued until all of those final details are taken care of but our approval vote enables that to happen Further questions or comments mr. Hayden yeah, I'd also uh, sort of um, as background I, I want to appreciate all of the the communications that we've been getting through the year as uh, when there have been questions about enforcement and, and issues so I mean, we're well aware of what's going on here and the resolutions for that kind of stuff, so. And they are all recommended for renewal yeah. because uh, there were no, no significant right, exactly. issues with any of those businesses. <clears throat> all right, Ms. Stein, would you like to make the motion? I move that the select board approve the list of renewals for alcohol and non-alcohol licenses presented dated December 3rd, 2012, subject to receipt of documentation noted as pending for the calendar year beginning January 1, 2013 through December 31st, 2013. Second. <coughs> Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Thank you. We'll have many more of those at our next meeting in two weeks. 
Uh, let's see what else have we got here. We have special licenses while we're on the liquor license subject. Ms. Stein. I move that the select board approve a special all alcohol license for Amherst College catering services on behalf of the trustees of Amherst College for a cash bar to be held for a 21 plus student activities event to be held on Thursday, December 6th, I hope, 2012 from 8 p.m. to 12 a.m. in the Freeman Room Keefe Campus Center at Amherst College, Greg Greg Wardlaw, Catering Manager. Second. For the discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 It's unanimous. I move that the select board approve a special oil alcohol license for Top of the Campus Incorporated on behalf of the University of Massachusetts for reception to be held Wednesday, December 12, 2012 from 4 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. in the Fine Arts Center, UMass Amherst, Meredith Schmidt, Assistant Treasurer. Second. For the discussion, Ms. Brewer. I would just ask, and I know that it's, it's the, um, <clears throat> an issue with the applicants, and it's a small one, but what we list the people's names for is as a contact person, and that we don't actually have a space on the form that says what their title is, and sometimes they include it and sometimes they don't. So it would just be, I think, helpful to just say Meredith Schmidt, Campus Center, Judy Bardwell Campus Center, just so that somebody knows where they are. They're not from the Fine Arts Center, they're from the top of the campus or Campus Center. I don't really care how we do it, it's just that it comes across slightly different every <laughs> single time and it's just like, okay, Meredith Schmidt works for the Campus Center, that's the important thing to know at this point. Um, and Judy Bardwell does too. So, something may be worth keeping track of, but whatever. Okay. Gotcha. And then the, the final one for Amherst College, which we haven't moved yet, we just will want to include a contact person on that one as well. Right. All right, so for the discussion on the second one, top of the campus, all in favor say aye. 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 Unanimous. Okay. I move that the select board approve a special wine and malt license for top of the campus incorporated on behalf of the University of Massachusetts for reception to be held on Friday, December 14th, 2012 from 3 p.m. to 5.30 p.m. in the atrium of the School of Management, UMass Amherst, Judy Bardwell. Second. For the discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 That's <coughs> unanimous. I move that the select board approve a special all alcohol license for hurricane boosters for a fundraiser to be held on March 16th, 2013 from 6 p.m. to 12 a.m. in Valentine Hall, Amherst College. And you'll have to fill in the name. Um, I looked at it and I couldn't decide if it was a student or actually the appropriate contact person. Peter Sylvan's a parent that's Peter a part Sullivan of the boosters. A parent. Okay. So could you fill in that name, please? Peter Sullivan. Sullivan. It's, on, it's actually on the form, it just doesn't say who he is. <laughs> okay. All right, been moved. and Mr. Hayden, would you like to second that? I would like to second Thank that. Thank you very much. Uh, further discussion? I'll just note that that is the annual uh, Monte Carlo night fundraiser for Amherst High School Athletics. It's a wonderful event, one of the really fun things that happens in town during the year. So mark your calendars, March 16th. <laughs> further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Thank you very much. It's okay. Ms. Brewer. I'll just add the follow-up that this is just part of my encouragement of staff to redo the form however they want <laughs> to make it work easier for them because it's obviously been old for a long time. Very good. All right. So now it is 645. Perfect timing because at 645 is our property tax classification public hearing, which I would like to now reopen at 645. You'll recall that this meeting, uh, this hearing was uh, given legal notice for 6 o'clock p.m. in this room. And so Mr. Hayden, Mr. Musanti, and I opened the meeting at 6 o'clock and immediately adjourned it to 6.45, just <laughs> like we were supposed to. So we are here with uh, Assessor David Burgess and John Kick and Marilyn Blaustein from the Board of Assessors. And this is something that we do every year. I will note that this particular select board has been doing this together for quite a long time now. I guess three years is the minimum for us, uh, four for most of us. Um, 
uh, but we're not going to preempt your presentation because you all work so hard on it every year. And because this is complicated, it's good to refresh all of our memories about it, and in particular, it's good for the public who may be turning in for the first time every year to know. That's what I wanted to say. Yeah. Okay, so with that. I was just about to say you could go ahead and make a motion. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> oh, I will note um, for folks who are following along at home uh, that uh, all of this information that uh, and Mr. Burgess has provided to us is also in our web packet. So everything you ever wanted to know about tax classifications, you've got access to. With that, Mr. Burgess. I'm not quite sure if it's everything. We, we never split the tax rate, but <laughs> at least we go for it. As Ms. O'Keefe said, this is our um, annual uh, setting of the classi classification. Uh, the classification, the select board, are the only people in Amherst that can make a decision if we are going to have one, a single tax rate for all classes of property if we're going to allow a residential exemption, or if we're going to have a small commercial exemption. So that is why we have to do this every year. Uh, I did speak to the Department of Revenue today, and there's a possibility this may not happen in the future if we decide to just go with one tax rate. Sometime they're talking about it, but that's a ways away yet. So just to start out, uh, this year valuations will not be changing in any significant amount. There will be individual changes for new growth, there will be some changes for uh, errors that we have found. We've, we're continuing with the program of uh, inspecting properties in Amherst. We started up in North Amherst. We've gone through the, most of the neighborhoods up there. We're about 25% finished, and we'll keep on going with that over the next three or four years. Uh, that said, some people are going to see some values go down. Some people are going to see things go up because we see it. But generally, properties will not change. Like last year, we changed 6%. That will not happen this year. If the select board votes to maintain a single tax rate, which I expect to do, we're looking at the moment at a tax rate being $20.39 per thousand. That's up approximately 65 cents from last year. And that will mean that the uh, average tax bill will be uh, $6,504 this year. And that's a change from last year which was $6,293, so it's going to be about $211. Uh, and that's all due to the, uh, new, uh, the, the increase in the levy amount by 2.5% and there is small reduction on the values because of the uh, abatements that we carried out during the year. Um, so that is the first thing you'll be deciding if you want to do that. This year's budget is $41,799,725. And with the total valuation of the town is now $2,050,011,060. That has gone down about $8 million from last year. Could you repeat that? $2,050,011,060. And that includes all classes of property, commercial, industrial, residential, and personal personal being all the uh, utilities and uh, business um, properties that have uh, inventory and various items that are taxable. So um, the average value of the property this year for a single family house will be 319000 and that is down about $200 from last year. Sorry, let me correct that. That's actually up $200 from last year. I'm sorry. So uh, that's because we've had some new houses that have been built and we've added them on. Um, the average value for a commercial property this year is $360,000. Uh, and that is up from last year when it was $354,800. Uh, so that's the big one. So that's, uh, if the select board voted to change the tax rate, in other words, apply more the value, uh, more value, more taxes to commercial, industrial, and uh, personal property than residential, you have the option of raising that by 50%. The impact would be that a property, a commercial property would pay on a tax rate of $30.58, up from the 2039. At the same time, the residential property would go down, the tax rate would go down, to $19.23 from $20.39. So the residential tax would go down about $370, 
while the commercial tax would go up about $3,700. That would be the impact of splitting the tax rate this year, if you did it, at the 50% level. The next item you've got to decide on is if you want to have a, a residential exemption. A residential exemption is an exemption that would be given to owner-occupied properties, and at the 20% level, that would mean the residential tax rate would go from $20.39 to $23.39. So those properties that didn't get it would see an increase in their value of uh, taxes of $3 per thousand. At the same time, um, the commercial, industrial, and personal would all stay at the $20.39. And the third item you have to deal with is a small commercial uh, value. This is the exemption of up to 10% of the property valuation that can be granted to commercial, not industrial properties, just commercial properties that meet the requirements set forth in the law, and that is the businesses must have occupied the property as of January 1st, 2011, and must have had no more than 10 employees certified by the Department of Employment and a valuation uh, of less than a million dollars. A business which is one of several businesses within the commercial building would not be eligible. It would go to the property owner, not the business. Similar to the residential exemption, the levy does not change and the exemption is born within the commercial class, resulting in an overall increase of the commercial, industrial, and personal class the value tax. The, we are unaware of any qualifying business properties in town, so you really have nothing to work with on that one. The other item is a selection of a uh, discount for open space. We don't have any discount for open space because we don't have any open space. Uh, all, our, all our open space is under uh, chapter lands and the commercial class, so we never have to worry about that. Those are the four items that you have to deal with, and we have three, uh, we have three motions. That while they're not in the book, Mr. Uh, Puller very carefully went upstairs <laughs> and made a motion sheet for me. They're on the select board's motion sheet. Huh? Do you, yeah, you don't have motions, do you? We have, we have, we have oh. motions. I didn't have motions. Let's hope they match. <laughs> yeah, we'll see, we'll see. Good if Dave had motions. <coughs> <laughs> All right, before we get to the motions. So, so that's, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to go ahead. Okay, first questions uh, from the select board. Ms. Brewer. I, I just want to thank Mr. Burgess again for having done this for several years now um, and having watched it even before I was on the select board. He, this, the explanation just keeps getting tweaked and getting better and better every year. So thank you. Having statements about the fact that you know, Amherst has never voted to discount for open space in the past because we don't have that kind of open space like you just pointed out. I mean, those kinds of things seem really confusing to people because they're like, open space, we've got lots of open space. So. Thank you for that and making those clarifications. Um, something we might want to add someday to the important terms section, something that sometimes confuses people, is the personal property concept. That personal property is all associated with businesses, as I understand it, and is self-reported? It is self-reported, but I, I want to make the, uh, people understand that while the apartment complexes are not considered commercial property for uh, um, Real estate purposes, for per, uh, for personal property, they are considered commercial property. So anything that they would have, such as machinery for lawns, gardens, laundromats, all the um, washers, dryers, and microwaves and the units, they are all personal property, and they would all be taxable. So they actually fall into a, a commercial point at that stage, when the real estate isn't. The person who has their own home does not pay on personal property. Uh, the other thing I wanted to make a note is that uh, Amherst several years ago through town meeting with the select board's uh, help voted that anyone with a value of $5,000 or less does not pay personal property tax. And that cut out quite a few of the small mom and pop operations, the two and three family units, uh, two family units and small businesses. So Amherst has helped along the lines, uh, business help, that exemption. 
and I'm sorry, I had another one. That's okay. Um, I believe you might have given a number, Mr. Burgess, but I'm not sure when you characterize new growth for us. Do you have a sense of, you know, just to, again, to give people some context, you know, seven new houses were built, 70 new houses oh, were built. <laughs> the, the new growth this year is not uh, all in the residential section. We've only had about five new houses built this year, but you've got to remember in that same period, uh, what's adding, what's saving our new growth this year I had originally estimated, I think, $450,000, and we came in at just on or just over 500000 I can't remember at the moment. But the uh, 12 units behind uh, Judy's came on this year, and the Lord Jeff came back on this year for the first uh, time in a long time. And those were large increases. And as well as that, the utility companies came in with nearly $6 million in valuation, which is nearly $100,000 in taxes. So. That, that all helps. Thank you. New That's very is useful. <laughs> actually up this year from last year. Thank you. Ms. Stein. When you have a mixed-use um, building, like the one behind Judy's, <clears throat> um, are the rental units above considered residential and the ones below considered commercial, or is the whole building considered commercial? No, we base, base it on the percentage, uh, and it's the uh, all of the property, all the residential will be classed as residential and the commercial will be valued as commercial. On Judy's, it's not just that parcel, or just that building, because Judy's itself is part of that parcel, so it ought, uh, that's why it's a mixed use. And it's very close to 60-40 now, I believe. Okay, thank you. Other questions or comments from the select board? Questions or comments from the public about the tax classifications? Okay, um, before we close the public hearing, I'll just note a couple of other things that we um, often talk about and I just don't wanna be kind of skipped over here. Um, okay, the single versus the split rate, as uh, Mr. Burgess mentioned, that if we were to go to a split rate, a split commercial rate, because we have about a 10% roughly uh, commercial property uh, percentage in town, the effect of the change is, as he mentioned, about t it's a it's a, the, the effect is tenfold for every three hundred dollars approximately that that would save a residential property that would increase a commercial property's cost by three thousand uh, dollars, and that's just so out of whack that that's among the reasons that in the past we have typically uh, or we have only uh, rejected that idea. Um, the Residential exemption, this is something that we uh, talk about every year in varying levels of detail. This is something that works particularly well in communities that have um, vacation populations, second home populations. Um, in communities that don't have that, like we don't have that, it doesn't work particularly well. Sometimes folks say, okay, well, what about the fact that we have such a high student rental population? Because typically what we say is among the impacts that it would have is it would, um, it would favor homeowners but then put a burden on rental properties and so at times like this people might be looking to increase the burdens on rental properties um, but uh, but there are various reasons that we have not gone along with that logic in the past um, one of them is that it is an exemption up to it's the tw uh, 20 percent right of the yes. value um, so there's actually a tipping point for many properties um, and in addition to burdening rental properties, which is not just students, of course, it's often low-income folks and others, um, it would, it, it has the tendency to make uh, the, it makes older homes, or not older homes, uh, more expensive homes considerably more expensive. Um, so we have always said that that might increase the incentive, especially for maybe an older person who's living in the old family homestead or anybody else who is house rich and cash poor to, uh, that would increase their tax burden considerably. Um, and so again, it would not be, it would not be targeting any tax, um, uh, assistance, what's the word I'm looking for, tax uh, relief a at all. It, it's a very broad brush that, that catches a bunch of uh, unintended victims in it. And the third thing that we talk about in relation to that is if we were to try it and then decide this just didn't work, it was a disaster, to switch back would be very complicated because then people's tax bills, it would, it would be a vast increase in people's tax bills to get us back to this level of normal. 
So, um, and also, let's see, we already talked about small commercial exemptions that, 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 that we just don't have commercial properties that qualify for that in Amherst. And I think we covered everything else. So I just kind of wanted to make sure that all the usual things are on the table for anybody who's tuning in for the first time. With that, are there any further questions or comments before we close the public hearing? All right, anyone from the Board of Assessors want to add anything to any of this? No? All right, then I will take a motion to close the public hearing. I so move. Second. And uh, all in favor of closing the public hearing at 701, say aye. <coughs> aye. Aye. Aye, and that is unanimous. All right, deliberation time for the, the questions before us. Um, we have always done what we've always done, and the circumstances don't seem to have changed at all. Would anyone care to uh, try and persuade us to make a different decision than we've ever made on any of these? Mr. Hayden. Yeah, and I want to say again that the... Uh, the presentation that we were given with all of the ups and downs and the what ifs is very helpful in reaffirming that we've made the right decision in the past. So, <laughs> thank you. Anything else about the, the classification questions? Any reason to consider changing at this time? All right, then, Ms. Stein, would you like to make the motions? I move that the, the select board adopt a minimum residential factor of one equal tax rate for all classes of properties for fiscal year 2013 and that no, no open space discount be provided. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. I move that the select board not adopt a residential exemption for fiscal year 2013. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. I move that the select board not adopt a small commercial exemption for fiscal year 2013. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 It's unanimous. Ms. Brewer. I, I don't know how to make this comment without it just sounding like a platitude, so I guess it's going to sound like one, but I hope that people understand, despite the fact that this all goes very smoothly because we've done it a million times, <coughs> we have a good structure to base it on, um, we take this tax rate very seriously. We realize it's high and we don't feel great about how high it is because we know it's hard for people, yet at the same time we know it has to be what it is. So I guess I don't want people to feel like, oh, we just blew right past that 20 bucks, whatever. Um, we know it's a serious concern for people, um, and we are trying in all the different things that we do, talking about priorities for the budget, et cetera, to address you know, making the most of what we've got associated with that. So while tonight was talking about the tax rate and all those underneath parts of it, we do recognize that it's also a substantial rate and we will do our best with it. Thank you, that's a good point. And it's also important to note that this is going up by the allowable two and a half percent that uh, under the state law for Proposition two and a half, um, plus the amount necessary to, to make up for the abatements, et cetera. Um, but that amount does not keep pace with inflation and how much even the programs and services that we have this year will cost next year. So uh, it's, a, it's, a very, it's a very complicated set of circumstances and, uh, and leaves us fiscally challenged, which is why Mr. Musanti's budget process is <laughs> about to get so uh, exciting in the, in the coming weeks because the budget that he presents to us in January has to deal with all of these realities. Is there anything you'd like to comment on about this, Mr. Musanti? Uh, no, I mean, I think that's, that's a, a good point to make about, you know, it's an ongoing effort about how we might be in a position to uh, have a situation where the tax rate per thousand is less. So it's obviously it's spending restraint, but also what's the appropriate mix in our tax base compared to the 90-10 residential commercial split uh, and all those kinds of things. So I just want to also uh, thank uh, Dave Burgess and his staff publicly for ongoing excellent work and the entire Board of Assessors, uh, Marilyn, John, and Carl Mailer who's not here tonight, uh, ongoing civic duty uh, in a very important uh, position <coughs> and also 2013 promises to be another exciting year including the provision of assessing services to our neighbor in Pelham that we've negotiated a fee on that Dave has done nice work on. Thank you very much. So thank you for all of your good work on this. Thank you for coming mm -hmm. in again. And uh, just to remind Mr. Bissande, I have one form there and he's, uh, have you all signed? 
We will do that. We'll, we will. I'll get that to you in the morning. Yeah. Well, I, fine. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. So it is now 7.06. The next item on our agenda is a 7 o'clock item, a new taxi business for Christian Cab. Is anyone here for Christian Cab? All right, we'll come back to that just in case he shows up. So our 705 item then is a request to petition the governor to close uh, the power plant at Mount Tom. And to speak to that, we have former select board chair, Elisa Campbell, and some colleagues with her. Welcome. I have, I have to say I do some of these budget things on my condo board, so I know exactly what kind of things <laughs> you're, you're dealing with. Um, I'm here today with Kim S Selznick and Drew Grande, and we're here to talk about coal and air pollution, and we brought a visual aid, um, a map of the exceedances of air pollution standards in the one hour permit in the area. As you can see, Mount Tom, Mount Tom itself, the Holyoke Range, Pelham Hills, et cetera, so I will let them have the microphone. Drew, and I, I'm the uh, holder of the poster for this evening. Very good. Thank you, Alyssa. Uh, th thank you, uh, thank you, the board, for allowing us to come here tonight to uh, to speak about this issue. Uh, my name is Drew Grandy. I'm an organizer with the, the Sierra Club, working on the the club's Beyond Coal campaign. Uh, the Beyond Coal campaign got started about 10 years ago, when 150 new coal-fired power plants were proposed for the country. Uh, communities around the country where those plants were proposed started organizing, started working to say this is not the future that we want for our community, it's not the future we want for our children, uh, and it's also not the economy we want our, we want our hometowns based around. Uh, from there, 162 proposed coal plants have been stopped from coming online, uh, and from that, from that point, the Beyond Coal campaign started working with other local communities to start retiring the, the existing fleet of coal-fired power plants that are out around the country. Uh, much like the Mount Tom coal plant here in uh, just down the road in Holyoke. Uh, Mount Tom was built in 1960. Uh, it's a relatively small plant, about 146 megawatts, uh, and it's also a very old plant. It's, it's, beyond, uh, it's beyond its expected life cycle, uh, and we're, we're taking a closer look at this plant and, and the effects it has on, on the communities. One of the biggest things that stuck out for us on Mount Tom is uh, the, 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 the position it's in, in Holyoke itself, uh, as you know, Holyoke is a community uh, full of uh, a, lot of, a lot of first and second generation immigrants that have come to this country. And one of the biggest things we, we learned when we started talking with these families is that they would, uh, a lot of them moved here from Puerto Rico and they said, I moved here healthy, my kids were healthy, and within a month or two, we developed a cough, we went to the doctor, and all of a sudden we're diagnosed with asthma. We came here healthy and now we have asthma. Uh, one of the people we worked with, Verhamina Perez, uh, she moved here in 1982. Three of her four children ha have asthma, and 12 of her 16 gr uh, grandchildren and great-grandchildren all have asthma. Uh, once we started hearing more of these stories, we took, again, took another closer look at, at the Mount Tom coal-fired power plant, uh, and we did, we, one of the things we noticed on it was that the Title V air permit, this is the permit that allows Mount Tom to uh, essentially put its, put its exhaust up into the air, was last issued in 2002. Uh, this month will mark five years since that permit expired. So that permit expired on December 31st, 2007. Uh, and what, what's happened since then is that the, there's been updates to clean air standards. And one of those clean air standards is the uh, NACS, National Ambient Air Quality Standard for Sulfur Dioxide. Sulfur Dioxide has been recognized by the EPA as an asthma irritant. Uh, and they've also set a level of uh, this, one, this 196 level right here of micrograms per cubic meter. So essentially a, a concentration of sulfur dioxide in a given volume of air. I would just comment that unusually on this map, red is better than blue. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's hard for me to get it through my head, but. Yeah, I, I think in, in, the, in the world of engineering, they, they decided that this is the color code they want to go with. But yeah, normally red is the worst, but in this one, red, red, is, red is the best, and it works up, up to blue and purple up here. But you can see there are areas here where there, is blue, there are blue and purples. Uh, and they are the mountain ranges. Yep, they are the, they are the mountain range, uh, you know, air, recreation areas that, that people come to the area to, to spend some time in. Uh, but the rest of the, a lot of these red and orange arees, especially in Holyoke and some in, some in Northampton, 
are areas where schools are located. And those, and those the children and, and, and older residents are the ones that are most at risk for this. But that 196 level is, the, is the, the level that the EPA has said, this is air that is unhealthy to breathe. This is air that if you have asthma, five minute exposure to this, you are at risk for, for developing an asthma attack. Uh, and if you are healthy, if you're exposed to this for, for longer periods of time, you're at risk for developing asthma. Uh, so we worked with a, an engineering company out of, out of Madison, Wisconsin to, to do an air model on, on, on the Pioneer Valley and on Mount Tom. And this is the results that they've come up with based on this new uh, ambient air quality standard. Uh, so what they found is that there are numerous violations here. And one of the biggest things that they've said is they, they kind of ran, ran this model twice for us. This is the model you're showing with Mount Tom. Uh, to show you this model without Mount Tom, essentially we would just take this background map and hand it over to you because we see these levels drop far below the, uh, the, the unhealthy level. Uh, so we can pretty conclusively point to Mount Tom as, as the culprit for, for this right here. Uh, and essentially what we're looking at is the, the air in the Pioneer Valley is unhealthy. We've seen uh, over the summer on a lot of the hot days, there were air alert days. The, the Department of Environmental Protection has issued air alert days for anyone of sensitive groups, and that's pretty much anyone, children or, 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 uh, or seniors, or anyone with, with any kind of breathing issue that may range from asthma to COPD to, uh, to, to, to any, any kind of uh, uh, affliction wor worse than that. But those are the people that are, that are at risk for this. Uh, and what this, what this standard says is that we don't have an issue currently the, you know, Mount Tom is, is meeting the, the expired permit that they're operating under. What we have is, what we have is that we, we're asking Governor Patrick to have his Department of Environmental Protection update the air permit so that, they comply, so, that, so that coal plant complies with all current air standards, including this, this ambient air quality standard here. Uh, so essentially what's happening is that Mount Tom is, is meeting the current permit but the Pioneer Valley isn't meeting ambient air quality standards that are set forth by the EPA because of that, because of that coal plant. I've got a copy of the, of the modeling report here I can pass on to the, to the board. And I have an electronic copy that I can pass on to, to everyone afterwards as well. Um, but I'm happy to answer any questions about that. Um, but right now I'll, uh, I'll give it back over to Kim and I think uh, any questions anyone may have, we'll, we're happy to answer at the end of that. Hi, um, my name is Kim Selznick. Um, thank you for allowing me to come speak on behalf of my generation who's very, very concerned about the environment. Um, I am a student at Hampshire College um, and there and within the five college system, I study environmental science and environmental social justice. Um, through these studies, um, I pretty much spend my days learning about how activities such as coal burning power plants are leading us towards one of the greatest environmental disasters of human history. Um, I've also learned in, through the environmental ju social justice component of my studies that these plants are often put in low income immigrant neighborhoods such as the one in Holyoke. Um, so as far as I can tell, the coal team and the burning of coal and the not switching to renewable energies of which we do have the technology and the mind power is a losing game. Um, this town, these colleges, Hampshire College particularly, is teaching me how to be progressive, how to be environmentally conscious, and how to fight for social justice. Um, I am asking for this town as a whole and this valley as a whole to fight against the grain in the same manner that it's teaching its students to. Um, I have a letter here um, that we would like you all to sign, read it over, think about it, um, to Governor Patrick asking him to retire this plant or at the least um, require them to operate under clean air permits that are up to date. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Questions or comments from these folks from the select board? Mr. Hayden. Yeah, I've got a, a couple of things. One is a very technical one. I'm looking at the map and it's granted it's, you know, 15 feet away. Um, there's quite a bit of granularity on that. I didn't realize there were that many sulfur dioxide monitoring stations. I only knew of two in the region. How do, we, how do you get to such a fine um, uh, map of, of the danger? Uh, 
keep in mind, I'm not a scientist or an engineer, but I can tell you that the way the, the, way the modeling was done, it wasn't uh, just from, just from monitoring, monitoring stations. Uh, what we were able to do is take actual um, data from EPA that, the, that Mount Time reports, reports to the agency on uh, the type of coal they're using, uh, the number of hours that the, the scrubbers are, are being turned on while they're operating, which is scrubber operation is less than operation of the plant. They don't always turn, turn the scrubbers on. So using data that Mount Time reports to the EPA uh, and then using that within the, the model that the engineering firm has used, they're able to, to set up this map here. So I uh, thank you. Um, I mean, that's, that's, I'm looking for something a little more technical than that. Um, I understand that the model behind it um, and that there's similar models for mercury, which is another contaminant, and, and, and nitrous, and um, um, magnesium, manganese, uh, there's all kinds of bad stuff that comes out of a coal stack. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm always a little bit, I want to be careful when we presented with data, which is not, which is a model. I mean, there are facts here, there are real problems here, mm -hmm. and I think they need to be honestly reported. Um, there's another thing that I'd like to point out about this particular uh, station. Um, it's got a sludge pond, uh, very similar to the one that um, collapsed and flooded a town. I can't remember where it, where it is now. K Kingston, Tennessee. Yeah, so we have one of those too, and it has the exact same kind of earthen dike around it. Um, and then leads me to my, my last question. Um, one of the things that, that I'm proud of here in Amherst is that we recognize that um, we can't just eliminate 146 megawatts worth of generation without replacing it with something. And that thing is apt as not to be another coal-powered uh, uh, power station someplace else further away from towns like Amherst that are active and interested in this thing. You speak of social justice. Um, so I'm proud that, that um, we have understood, and I'm hopeful when I look at the... Um, at the proclamation, or at the request here, that we keep shutting the power plant down, whether it's a nuclear power plant in Vermont nearby, a coal power plant, you know, here nearby, or coal plants in Ohio, which are not so nearby, but the air gets to us too. Mm -hmm. That we are actively replacing that with something with renewables. You know, um, Governor Patrick has a very comprehensive program if for the state. Mm -hmm. Um, which is under some attack. Um, in fact, it's under attack every time a project is proposed in places like Waitley or Amherst. Um, and uh, we have to recognize that we can't just shut these things off. Yes, it's making our kids sick. Yes, it's threatening our river with the sludge. Yes, it's putting mercury into the air. But we can't just turn them off without doing whatever it is beyond coal. And I'm kind of hopeful that you're as active in talking about you know, why natural gas may not be the exact best way to go. It's a nice stopgap for the meantime. Why we have to support efforts for solar power and other renewables. Thank you very much. Ms. Campbell, please speak into the mic. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think no one disagree. The Sierra Club does not disagree with anything you said, you know. Um, we're actually asking at this point that the current air standards be enforced on this plant. That's what the, the letter is basically asking for. Um, and of course, the Sierra Club has been out there supporting solar and wind installations here as well as other places. And like the town of Amherst has gotten some flack for it, generally about wind rather than solar. But, you know, I think we're all on the same side. Thank you very much. Other questions or comments from Select Board right now? Okay, so you've given us good information. You've given us a draft letter, which we're now just seeing for the first time. Um, I think we need to sort of chew on this for a while. If we have questions for you, we will get back to you. If we have a new draft that we would like revised, and in fact, if you could send electronic versions of the where, materials you provided. Where, where should I send that to? Uh, to the Select Board address, which is selectboard at amherstma.gov. The modeling report the modeling there as well. Report too. 
That would be great. Yeah, anything we could get electronically would be great. So in case we want to um, either adopt or revise the letter or anything like that, whatever our next steps yeah. are in the future, it would be easiest to have all those electronically. And if we get these to a next step such that it's on an agenda, again, we will let you folks know. Great. So, uh, uh, the other thing I do, uh, Mr. Hayden, I can get you in touch with the engineering firm that did this for us. They can better answer your question than, than, I, than I could as far as how the modeling uh, was conducted. Oh, that would be cool. You like that? Yeah, yeah I, can, I can do that. Same, amherstma.gov. Yep. Get you there. Um, Ms. Brewer. Beyond the time frame of five years ago, um, in terms of <laughs> current time frame, is there a particular deadline that you're looking to get letters in by, et cetera, just uh, in terms of our planning? If we could do this uh, in the next four weeks, I, I, I think would be would be great. Uh, on last Tuesday, we just delivered 1,600 petitions from residents of Massachusetts to Governor Patrick, uh, asking him to, to act on, on uh, renewing the, the air permits for Mount Tom. And several towns have already sent a similar letter. Yeah, we've seen uh, Sh Shootsbury has, has, has sent a similar letter, uh, and then Northampton, East Hampton are in, are in the similar kind of same steps as where you guys are right now. Uh, they've got maybe a two week jump on you right now, but uh, sim similar situation. Okay. Yeah, so, right, uh, right. so after the first of the year would be still good enough. Yep. Okay. Still be good. Um, and just one other point. So, as as we're talking about retiring coal plants across the country, we we are we are as you're saying we are working to support clean renewable energy in other places. We've seen Mount Tom go from about 3,600 hours of operation uh, four or five years ago to only 800 in the first half of this year. So we're seeing that plant come down, uh, and we're also working with the governor's administration to to actively help push those clean renewable projects where, where, where it makes sense and where it's smart to do so, uh, whether that's through energy efficiency, we're proud to see Massachusetts be the number one energy efficient state in the country. Uh, excited to see the governor out in this area in, in Florida today, uh, opening up the new wind project that happened there. We're also working with uh, the governor's administration, also the federal gov government, with the uh, the Boehm process and and uh, for the offshore wind project in uh, off of uh, Massachusetts waters there as well. So if there's any other projects, uh, around the state, we're always happy to jump in, but also if there's anything happening here in Amherst, please let us know how we can help you out with any kind of uh, energy efficiency or clean renewable projects. We're always, we're always happy to, uh, to lend our voice to that and, and, and support uh, anyone do, uh, working to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate your you. time and all your information. Um, so Mr. Hayden, as someone who clearly has uh, interest and knowledge about this, would you be willing to sort of take this to the next stage with us, and uh, for us rather, and anyone who is uh, has a keen interest, as Mr. Hayden does, to consider the letter, recommend a next step for us. Um, if, if there is one, you know, just kind of let me know if this should be on the agenda either next time or uh, in January or whatever. Mr. Hayden. Yes, because it is important. Okay. So you'll, you'll, you'll shepherd this to the next steps for us. I will. And with Mr. Wald. Perfect. Yeah, so, yeah. I'm sorry, um, I can't give you a report also. What? Passing along the report to Mr. Hayden also. Oh, yeah, sure, great. Okay, good. So Mr. Hayden will bring this back to us for next action, and anyone uh, who wants to have a hand in that before it gets to us, get with Mr. Hayden. Okay, moving along. Um, sir, are you here for, from Christian Cab? Yes. Terrific. Please come forward. Yeah. And it, it could, what's your name? My name is Daniel Okorafo. Welcome. Okay. So you are starting a new taxi business in Amherst? Yes. And you are aware that as of January 1st, we are changing our taxi regulations and requiring all t cabs to have built-in fare meters. Meters, yeah, I'm aware of that. Okay, okay, good. Um, all right, so, um, so this gentleman's application has gone through all of the regular processes in the office and with the chief of police and is being recommended to us for um, for approval, um, do folks have questions for, could you pronounce your last name again for me? Okorafor. Okorafor, thank you very much. Any questions for Mr. Okorafor? Mr. Hayden. Maybe not directly, but maybe for us. When are there enough taxi cab companies in town? How will we know? It's a good question. I don't think it's now, I, I, but, <laughs> but it, it's, it's one that, that we're, I know we're grappling with this and some other types of licenses. And well, there's a lot of these. Right, so there's not a direct answer. What we do know with the new regulations is that we have the ability to limit the number yes. that's specific in, in the new regulations. Um, I think we won't know 
how the taxi industry is functioning in Amherst until we get a sense of how the transition goes. I think that the metering of cabs is probably going to shake out, if not companies, certainly vehicles, because we've kind of raised the expense and the level of investment that's required to, to operate legally here. Um, so the, the, the question will remain a question for a while. Ms. Brewer. Yeah, along those lines, um, there's, it seems like there's always town meeting when we're trying to plan. Well, when should we follow up on this? Oh, wait, town meeting time. No, wait, that's town meeting time, <laughs> too. Um, how about, like, June, maybe? Because maybe even July? Because that would give us time for, you know, people to have actually installed these things and then said, you know what, I'm not going to bother with that van anymore, et cetera. And like you said, some of this fallout end of the school year, et cetera. Because I think it will be good to have a sense you know, before the next whole year starts of licenses of where things are going rather than just assuming a whole year all go by. So I don't know, maybe yeah, that's a good point. or something. I can plug it into the calendar, so we'll make sure to be getting feedback from, uh, from the police folks and from the inspections yes. folks about how the new regulations are, are working out there in the field. Okay, but for Mr. O'Cor for a specific uh, application right. right now, so he'll be... He'll be running under the current regulations for the next couple of weeks, uh, and then the new regulations as of 2013. Mr. Musanti. Just the, the application is actually for the new calendar year beginning January 1. Oh, I apologize. So you're not going to start having cabs yeah. in Amherst this um, month at all? Oh, January 1, yeah. Okay, so say. this is a new license, so this way it skips the renewal process, so that makes good sense. Okay, so you're, you'll be operating entirely under the new regulations, which okay. presumably you've seen and are aware of. All right, uh, Mr. Hayden. I, I see that you're the first driver for the, the company. Yes. I, that's what I understand here. Yes. Um, it's been a long time since I've been able to ask the question, um, <laughs> how well do you know your way around town? Yeah, I, I lived in Amherst for 24 years. I just moved to South Hadley um, <laughs> last, I mean, in uh, 2007. So I went to UMass and I lived in Amherst for 24 years. So. I know the area very well. Okay, thank you. Excellent. Okay, any other questions for Mr. Okorafor? Ms. Stein, would you like to make the motion? Sure. I move that the select board approve a new taxi business license for Daniel Okorafor, doing business as Christian Coach Taxi, 13 Montague Road, Amherst, MA, for the license year to begin January 1, 2013 through December 31st, 2013. Second. For the discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Congratulations. Good luck to you. And uh, thank you very much. look forward to your new business. Mr. Hayden. Thank you. <laughs> Drive safe. <and> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. All right. Moving right along. We have, speaking of town meeting, we have our uh, semi-annual uh, town meeting wrap-up discussion. Uh, we try and do this at the first select board meeting following the wrap-up of each town meeting during the year um, to just talk about uh, particularly our process part of it, but also any other thoughts or suggestions we have about how town meeting went and how it might be improved for the future. So before it gets banished from our minds by, uh, by other things, we, uh, we try and have this conversation promptly. So uh, we did just finish town meeting. It finished in three sessions. This time we started, uh, we, we did our experiment of starting at seven o'clock and I have not gotten any formal feedback from town meeting coordinating committee on that yet. Uh, they are looking for folks to return the surveys that we included in their packets that or rather TMCC included in their packets and made available during town meeting. So anyone who's watching this who's a town meeting member is encouraged to get their feedback to town meeting coordinating committee about how they felt about the seven o'clock start time. Um, so otherwise, how did folks feel? Mr. Hayden. About the seven o'clock start time, um, I might notice that a quorum call every night, well, I mean, the select board was late one night, but otherwise the quorum call was, was pretty close to, to seven o'clock. I think the latest was like seven, quarter past seven or something like that. So that kind of sounds like an endorsement to me from town meeting members themselves. Thank you. Yeah, so I'll note, uh, you're right, the quorum call was around sort of 10 past-ish nightly, which means that uh, that was 20 minutes before 7.30 that we had three nights, which is an hour, which could have been the difference between coming back or not for, for a session. So thank you. Good point. 
Other thoughts about town meeting, Ms. Brewer? Um, I, th I think it might be useful to speak with the planning board, and, and I don't mean that the chair just has to talk to her husband, even though I guess they're occasionally allowed to do that, but perhaps in a, a slightly more formal fashion. Um, on two issues. One is whether or not it seems worthwhile, given the experience we just had, of trying to set the citizen zoning petition deadline even earlier, which I know sounds awkward to people, but nonetheless, it's, there's no requirement to file citizen petitions. One can just work through the planning board. If one wants to have something that one is sure is the one's own, then it, um, it doesn't seem unreasonable to perhaps add even more time into that process, assuming the planning board thinks that would help them in their process, particularly when they have very similar sorts of things going on. Um, it's unusual that they would have completely separate things going on where you know they, they have no idea that petitioners are working on something and they wouldn't even attempt to be working on something at the same time. But to, to get a better sense of that, to see if there's a point to making that earlier um, so that it doesn't feel quite so rushed toward the end with you know, uh, rewrites up to and including on the floor. The other aspect to that that I think is just always complicated for zoning, but like the longer I serve in town meeting, I guess the more it comes back to me, is that if people are going to question zoning when we get um, to the actual articles, rather than just saying, sure, sure, whatever the planning board wants, um, then they need to remember that those books, those zoning bylaw books, have actual useful information in them. And then, so if there's a way that we can, if you know, planning board wants to work <coughs> with us in some sort of joint eff education effort, or bring TMCC into it. But there were people who were saying, well, does that mean I can do this anywhere? It's like, no, it says right here, you can do it in RVC, you can do it here and here. And then they're like, what's that mean again? And I was like, you know what? Actually, as much as we try and put into the warrant, you can't assume that that's enough. You have to be able to put it into the bigger context. And so I think sometimes when people go to that very first, if they have the chance to go to the moderator's education session that says, here's your zoning bylaw, here's your town meeting, blah, 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 blah. Um, but then they forget and that those things all fit together and that it's kind of hard to take it completely out of context and say, oh, I don't actually know what that means because I don't know what the definition section actually says before this and what the section before it and what the section after it looks like. So, um, you know, personally, uh, zoning is not my most thrilling aspect of my life and <laughs> I'm willing to concede some of those points to people I consider more expert on the subject and one can't prevent all questions and one doesn't want to. But in terms of just people understanding their role as a town meeting member, I think there needs to be a better grasp of the fact that zoning things are complicated because they take place inside a much bigger picture than we necessarily see within an individual warrant article. And although they don't have to memorize the whole book, they have to be able to know that there are different sections of it that they'll need in order to understand. So future education effort. Okay, so I think that, that, that your point is kind of largely about um, town meeting members doing sufficient homework, just like we want them to do homework on the budget, you know, read the, the uh, um, right. finance committee report um, before spring town meeting. Um, the zoning bylaw is an important part of your preparation for zoning articles. Additionally, there is a zoning primer document yes. that perhaps should be uh, encouraged uh, for to be circulated Time more and just kind of remind yeah. people about those because that Good is a, that's a very helpful document and uh, and you're right it's it's full of kind of arcane detail uh, very complicated and interrelated detail and um, just to have a refresher on it for folks to kind of do their own personal refresher course on that before uh, e each town meeting could be helpful Okay, um, as far as the citizen zoning petition calendar stuff, um, you'll be happy to know that my husband and I actually try to talk about things other than town <laughs> at <laughs> possible so opportunity, glad. so we do minimize these things. Um, so yeah, it does, doesn't have anything to do with what I talk about, talk, talk to him about, and in fact, what we'll do with these suggestions is what we do with them always, which is we kind of give the whole thing to TMCC, but also give, um, pass along the relevant elements to whatever other bodies it is relevant to. So um, so these two elements of um, that are relevant to the planning board, I will I will pass along to them as well. Uh, yeah. And anything else we come up with? Mr. Eden. Yeah, I would like to just uh, point out or, or recall, I found myself um, going back to the uh, planning department's um, um, 
presentations for, for those articles. I mean, that, those are very, very helpful in at least steering you into the right place if you want to do more research. So I just want to point out, I want to be appreciative of that. And I don't know um, if, there's, if there's some way, um, I don't know, to have, have more to them to help people not have to flip through their zoning. I mean, I know the rules, sort of. Um, I spent a lot of time with them. Um, but still, I found myself going to the report and saying, oh, yes, I remember that. Now I, I'm going to just go bone up on that for a second and make sure I've, I've got that clear. So I found those to be very helpful, not unlike the uh, paragraphs after each section and the, the budget that each department puts in. But still, um, I don't know if we want to uh, encourage more verbosity there or something um, beyond saying I, I appreciate them. They, they really do work. Thank are very you. helpful. Okay, Mr. Wald. Yeah, in the, in the same vein, <clears throat> you know, these things are always a two-way street, and I think we need is both better communication and instruction on the part of town officials and better homework on the part of town meeting members, which we know, we know is difficult. And Mr. Hayden's in an unusual position because he chaired the planning board and immersed himself in these things. The rest of us are still learning, uh, some more, some less. Uh, and I guess one of the things that, that concerns me is that zoning is by nature complicated, and all too often we hear people say they can't support something because it's too complicated to understand. We've got to figure out what the problem is, you know, to what extent it's the thing itself or the communication. Uh, I think in Egypt right now they're being asked to pass a constitution with something like 230 clauses by December the 15th, and you don't want to be in that position. Uh, but we can't keep putting things off forever, too. So I want to pick up something that Ms. Brewer mentioned, I believe, at one of the select board meetings during town meeting uh, with regard to petition articles, because, you know, it's wonderful that citizens are so involved in Amherst that they bring forward articles, they begin to try to learn zoning, imperfectly sometimes, but they make the effort, and they get something in shape that the planning board can deal with it, that we can deal with it. But Ms. Brewer mentioned that there are alternative routes, and one of these, of course, is not to bring forward your own article, but simply to approach the planning board and say, here's what we want to do. In other words, maybe it's less important whose name is on it and where it comes from than what the result is, because if you look at the actual votes in town meeting, the ones, if I'm not mistaken, that had the highest degree of collaboration between town hall that is, town manager's office, select board, planning board, and so forth, passed. And others tend to get referred back or not sure. And especially given that we've got a two-thirds uh, threshold, uh, you know, success is in our mutual interest. So that might be one route to try. You know, not just earlier submissions of citizen articles, but earlier conversation with planning board about joint efforts. Just a thought. Thank you. And I'll note that um, part of the uh, planning board's process is to hold, I believe they do it twice a year also, is a zoning forum right. where they are collecting input f to help uh, add to their list and, and figure out their priorities for things going forward. So, um, so it's very important also for folks to be, to be participating in that if they want to make their priorities known. Okay, Ms. Stein. Uh, we had talked about a cons <coughs> consent agenda and I don't know what I would have put on it, but it didn't come to pass. So I was wondering to whom we should re-suggest that. So maybe for the um, annual town meeting in the spring, it could happen. Okay, thank you for that point. So yes, we did, um, we talked about the consent calendar recommended its consideration uh, for usage. Um, last time. That is something that's under the moderator's control and he needs to have that published. I believe it's 10 days prior. It's not a spur of the moment decision. Um, when we got our feedback from uh, TMCC, they said they didn't have a problem with it, which I think was good to know. Um, what I think would actually be useful if we're going to kind of change course and go the consent calendar route, it would be good for TMCC to back that and to encourage its use and so that they're kind of preparing folks ahead of time about w what this means and here are the things that are part of it and here's how you get more information and et cetera um, because that, that will be something that's different for the body so it needs some introduction. So I think that I personally I think TMCC needs to do more than not oppose it. They would really need to support it and kind of champion it if that were to in have its greatest um, chance of success going forward because as we know anyone can p 
pull something out of the consent con calendar. And I believe the last time it was used, which was probably 2007, um, it, it just stopped being used because people were always objecting to the stuff that was, was in it. They wanted it all pulled out. And with, with uh, I think, really inadequate uh, reasons for that being, oh, well, there are always new town meeting members, you know, people might not understand what we're voting on. Well, yes, but that's what the finance committee report is for, and that's what the warrant review is for. There are all kinds of ways to get your questions answered. Everything is very well explained. At the same time, you do have the, the opportunity to ask questions about anything you want. Um, so if, if something should be pulled out of the consent calendar, then it should, but um, just kind of a blanket, oh, some people might not understand, isn't quite a good enough reason. So it's reasons like that that I think it would be really helpful for TMCC to get behind um, the the what and why of the consent calendar if that were to be successful. But uh, I appreciate you bringing that up again. Mr. Hayden. Yeah, I, w I might, uh, on that point, I, I just, I did take a good hard look at the uh, at the warrant when we first received it to try to think of how Report. we could possibly group anything in that particular uh, warrant into um, into a consent calendar. And, and they were disparate enough that I think that would have been difficult at, right. at best as most of the things maybe except for not paying the bills that we don't owe, um, really did require a, a discussion. So that sets uh, in reverse order. A, another point I'd like to make is that I, I appreciate that um, despite the complexity of some of the articles that we're looking at, there was much less of the confusion expressed for, by members of town meeting this time than in, in times before. Um, I just wanted to appreciate, I, I know that a significant number of town meeting members spent a lot of time, you know, working and trying to figure figure these things out before they voted. And I think Mr. Wald is is, is correct to point out how well that works and how valuable that that effort is, and that we appreciate it. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Okay, I'll note that. Um, personally, I think that uh that we do need to look at, and and I'll be meeting with uh, the town manager and uh, Ms. Roussel in the office about the calendar in general. Um, and I don't know how much of it, as Ms. Brewer's point to how much of it was about the citizen petition articles and how that kind of changed things, um, but uh, it, our, our process was, was rougher going into it. I mean, it really emphasized to me how much we do not want to be taking positions on articles at the middle school. <laughs> I, uh, in thinking about the votes, I mean, it really, we're we're not able to give due diligence to things when we're making a decision, when we're sitting there going, okay, uh, yeah, we've gotta be in there in five seconds, so yeah, mm, okay, how about we take no position? Or yeah, <laughs> sure, we support it. Like that, that's just, that's not fair to us, it's not fair to town meeting, um, and I think that some of our decisions were rushed that way because we were taking the path of least resistance. We needed to get done and get in there. Um, and so I don't know how much the, the <coughs> calendar part, by changing the deadlines, could figure into that. I don't know how much of it maybe is improving our communication to, say, petitioners about what what our needs are in, in terms of trying to um, take a position on things. And, and obviously, I mean, it is the system that we all have to work on it and uh, work within it. And, um, and sometimes it's just imperfect, and, and maybe we just sort of had a perfect storm of, of imperfections, if you will, this time. But, um, but if there are ways that the calendar can be tweaked, for example, even at the beginning of our process, we always start taking positions on articles before we sign the warrant. We've been doing this for as long as I've been on select board. Um, but for some reason, we didn't have enough materials ahead of time this time, and I don't know what the problem was with that. I'm not sure if people were not getting communicated to that they needed to have their packet materials, or if I was doing a bad job of setting up which articles we were gonna deal with at what time, because their materials weren't ready. So there's just kind of a general, like, sitting back and going, okay, <laughs> what just happened, and <laughs> how do we make it better than needs to happen? So, um, so if you have any particular thoughts, either now or, or later, about the calendar part of it that should feed into that discussion, um, then, then definitely let me know, because that, that will be important to me. Ms. Stein and then Mr. Hayden. Um, one of the things that made it difficult, but I think it's okay, was the fact that some of the articles kept changing. Right, sure. And there wouldn't have been much we could have done till they got to their most completely changed form and actually became considerably shortened, which helped. 
Right. So that's part of it. Like the, the process is what it is. And obviously that's that right. needs to be able to happen. And we, so we can't deal with every eventuality, exactly. but are there some of them that we could have anticipated better? And uh, so I think on our end that, that there probably is. And, and maybe we also need a better mechanism for, uh, you know, instead of a rush decision, maybe we just don't even bother, you know, <laughs> maybe we just say to town meeting, you know, not only are we taking no position, we're taking no position because we just didn't have the time to adequately consider this. It's nobody's fault. It's just that's how this has ended up. But rather than sitting there, you know, talking about it as though we're being thorough when really we're just being, we're just scratching the surface and then we go in and, and make some kind of a rushed vote that maybe we're not all comfortable with having been ready to take the vote. I, I'm not sure we added any value. And in fact, sometimes we might be providing misdirection to town meeting if they think we've considered this more thoroughly than we did. So um, so just kind of weighing all of those um, all of those pieces is something we'll try and do better. Mr. Hayden. Yeah, I was, I was going to, to, to notice that the, the articles that we were most rushed about were the ones that were changing most right to the end. Uh, I also wanted to comment is that there'll never be enough time. I mean, let's be a little bit careful about imagining, you know, a nirvana where we can get it all done and have nice ribbons on the packages before town meeting. For sure, and that's an excellent point. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I say this all the time that anything that we do that we've been doing over and over again is a question of are we doing it by accident or are we doing it on purpose? And so if we're doing it on purpose, then that's good. And if it's, we're doing it on, by accident and it, we shouldn't be doing it that way, then let's change it. So, um, so we do sort of uh, always use the same calendar and, and just sort of move up the dates, et cetera. But if there are ways, especially from what we learned from this, and really uh, one of the key things was about the materials that we had ahead of time when we needed them. Um, and, uh, and so making sure that that's very clear, particularly to petitioners, um, to, just to, to bec because it's part of all of the, it's part of all of the different kinds of preparations that are happening. So I, I wanna be very clear that I'm not in any way um, criticizing, as I know my colleagues are not, the petitioners and, and the timing that happened here and everything that happened at the end of the process in particular was happening at the end because it was the end of the process. Um, but, uh, but anything we can do to improve the front of the process to kind of bring us to a better place at the end, then, uh, then we will try and do that. So, uh, so yes, Mr. Eden. I also don't want us to dismiss the value of the select board's position. Um, I mean, we uh, are responsible for taking maybe a different view, <coughs> the other view, than, than other boards might be. And, and I think it's, it's important that we help town meeting as much as we can to make their decision on these things. So I don't want to throw that away. Yeah, and that's an important point. And we noticed that a couple of times at the, with the articles at the end. When, when select board and planning board was in agreement with the petitioners, that was a powerful statement to folks. Um, the select board made a different recommendation on one of the articles than the planning board did at the end. Again, that was a really rushed decision. And as soon as we were done, I was like, Wait a minute, that wasn't what we should <laughs> yeah. do. So, and that really kind of Sorry confused town <laughs> meeting, I think. So, but again, that was part of our being rushed. And um, and so, yeah, I, I think it, I think it was a very good learning experience for us to have gone through it that way, you know, and with with no ill result really. But j it gives us a lot to try and improve on, um, to think about trying to improve on for next time. Others. <coughs> Okay, so it's really uh, scheduling stuff, taking a look at that, um, encouraging more um, more and better use of kind of the preparation materials that we have, the uh, potentially that zoning primer thing, um, the zoning bylaw, uh, the planning board reports, and whether they might uh, even have more detail perhaps. Um, consent calendar. Okay, anything else people are thinking of right now, Ms. Brewer? Um, this is actually not within our purview, but I heard some just random comments that check-in was not smooth every night. And so <coughs> it would, it might be worth just checking in to find, <laughs> checking in with the check-in <laughs> to see if there was something we could have done that would have made their lives easier. Um, because okay. it just seemed a little bit more, a lot more people standing in the hall and a lot less people getting materials um, rather than the kind of usual just flow that tends to go on. Yeah, 
Maybe so that might be another got tripped up somewhere. That might be another information opportunity because um, I think that started happening last spring, and I think that that was part of once we stopped needing tally cards, cards for every new night. So I think that there might be that some might confusion be some. about what you're doing when you're checking in, whether you need to, yada yada yada. Um, so maybe just maybe part of it is communication and I don't know what else is happening there because of course we don't check in but uh, right. Mr. Heaton. <laughs> Which uh, brings me to a, a question I guess that more of a question to, to ask. Um, I'm wondering how well the uh, the cards are working out. I mean there were a couple of you know, sort of Harrison had to stop and hand stuff out and make those arrangements, which is fine. I mean, it's just a ton of paper that was not used. Um, but I, I just want to sort of maybe check in to make sure that we're on the right track with that still. Uh, I wonder with who, who, yeah, who would know if that's working <laughs> or not. Like, so as a body, we, we have never yet um, gone beyond our cards. It would, it would make sense for me to follow up with the town clerk. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, it, thank you. But where issues were identified, if any. Mm -hmm. yeah. That. Other thoughts on this <coughs> subject at this moment? Very well. If you think of anything else, uh, uh, let me know, and we'll put it on the agenda again for next time. Uh, in the meantime, I will summarize this discussion. Uh, it will be in your list tomorrow or whenever I get that to you, and I will send that to TMCC and other appropriate folks. Ms. Brewer. Not that I can imagine there's a member of the public who watches select board meetings who doesn't already know that Harrison's retiring. Oh, thank you. But... <laughs> um, I, while I'm sure someone would make much grander remarks than I would beyond thanking Harrison for his many years of service, I think that one of the things that people don't recognize is that the select board chair, the finance committee chair, town manager, town manager's office, and the moderator do an immense amount of work behind the scenes organizing this every time around. And of course, everybody has their own style, and it'll be different. So that will be part of, of what we're moving into, too, is, you know, depending on who runs, depending on what ideas they have, that might bring us you know, a new consent calendar idea, but it might also change some other things. So uh, more challenges ahead. Yes, indeed, that's an excellent point, and thank you for just the opportunity to also remark on the fact that this was, uh, as uh, Harrison Gregg announced, his final town meeting session as moderator, unless we, get, we call another special town meeting between now and May 6th. And Let's hope we don't do that. <laughs> we can't think of an excuse to do that. <laughs> right. one we more better time. not think of an excuse. But uh, Harrison Gregg has served as town moderator for 19 years now. Uh, that's an extraordinary run of service in an incredibly difficult job. Um, not only does he uh, is he responsible for running town meeting, but he also has the appointments of the finance committee and other things that come up that he is the appointing authority for. For example, the right. Regional School District Planning Committee that town meeting established uh, a year ago that Ms. Brewer is the representative to. Um, so uh, I, I was saying to Mr. Musanti and Mr. Hayden before the meeting started, it's a, it, it's, it's a very difficult job. It's a very intense job. And it's one that typically, you know, when you're doing it really well, people don't notice because you're doing it really well. Uh, and so they kind of take that for granted. And it's only when you, you trip up every now and then that people notice. And <laughs> that's what gets all the heat. So that really makes it extra difficult. Um, and he really has just done a, a, an extraordinary job for all of these years. And, uh, and it, he's, he's the face of town meeting. It's exactly. really going to be very different. And uh, <coughs> wow, incredible. And uh, just in general, thank him so much for his service. And uh, it's been a heck of a run. Mr. Hayden. Yeah, I'd like to uh, also sort of to, add, to pile on, if you will, um, to, to remark on the quality of, of the service that, that he did render to town meeting um, to the point that it was recognized by his colleague moderators and, and he's chair or will have was, been chair yeah. of the state town moderators secret cabal, whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Yes, he was president of the Moderators president, Association exactly. uh, 11 years ago. And, uh, and anyone who is <coughs> interested enough in town <laughs> government that you're watching this meeting, uh, but you might have missed the town meeting, uh, definitely go to uh, the Amherst Media website or a look on YouTube or whatever. But Amherst Media has put together a great clip of the farewell speech at the end. And, uh, and uh, the moderator read some wonderful remarks that he had written upon becoming president of the moderators. In fewer than three minutes. Association, yes. And uh, 
it was it was very powerful it was a it was a very meaningful uh, way to close his term of service and it was really lovely for the body to have the opportunity to appreciate him in that way that has got to be the longest standing ovation I've ever seen <laughs> I think so uh, so that was lovely so do check that out that is a that is a separate <coughs> clip of video in addition to being part of the whole video of that town meeting night so all right thank you anything else on town meeting very well moving right along Next up, we have town manager's report. Great, thank you very much. Uh, want to update you on a number of uh, issues, including uh, a safe and healthy neighborhoods working group. Uh, you know that I appointed a work group that has now uh, 17 members, representing uh, a wide spectrum of, of uh, uh, interests uh, on uh, neighborhood issues, uh, most notably related to issues related to uh, rental properties. We have a work group that I've asked Dave Zomek to, to chair. Uh, we've got UMass representatives, neighborhood, multiple neighborhood representatives, uh, uh, Ms. O'Keefe representing the select board, Sandra Anderson from planning board. Uh, we have uh, public safety leaders, health director, uh, planning staff, uh, some uh, one or two students we think will be appointed uh, in the days ahead. Uh, we've had our first meeting uh, last week on November 27th. Very ambitious, uh, but I think achievable uh, uh, charge, which is to develop uh, specific recommendations for uh, review by me and then consideration uh, for spring town meeting related to rental registration and property, uh, uh, rental property inspection protocols. And then also looking at our foreign related persons uh, bylaw and offering suggestions, if any, on how to further improve that bylaw. So very ambitious. We had a very excellent meeting last week. Uh, people are engaged. Uh, there's a, a website that is growing by the day uh, if you go to the home page of the town website and click on living uh, tab, you'll see the Safe and Healthy Neighborhoods uh, web page. All the background information for our efforts in this area, progress reports from departments, uh, and the work uh, and the backup documentation that the work group is, is looking at are being posted uh, as we go along. Uh, their next meeting is tomorrow, and they'll be working up calendar and some other things and really getting into the nitty-gritty with any number of uh, best practices uh, examples from other college towns uh, and other experiences from the members that they want to bring to bear on improving our systems and protocols and also uh, specific suggestions from uh, the neighborhood uh, folks who are active on this effort with us so I'm uh, uh, very optimistic I think it's uh, it's off to a good start, and they'll they'll be very very busy over the next uh, two to three months, and we can you can expect to see, uh, I think, some action recommendations at the spring town meeting. Uh, related I'll to just that, add a couple things to that. Or is, sure. I'm sorry, were you going to move on to a different subject? Or? Uh, I was going to talk about security details. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'll just add a couple things about the safe and healthy work group before you get into that. Um, the uh, he is absolutely right. It was a great meeting. It is a very uh, ambitious plan and time frame, but uh, I'm very confident we'll be able to do it. And in fact, I promised town meeting that we would, and I have every intention of fulfilling that promise. Um, the um, so folks know this is a working group that has a ton of work to do. It is a public meeting. They happen in this room. People are welcome to attend. Um, because there's so much work to do, public comment is not being taken during the meetings, but public comment is encouraged by email. Anyone can give any thoughts to the group that they want by either emailing Mr. Zomek, whose email is all over the town website, or um, myself, who, if you don't have my personal email address, you can certainly send it to the select board, and I, I will take that to the group. Um, so, uh, and it's possible that a safe and healthy work group email is going to be set up for that purpose as well. Um, the other thing that's going to happen is at certain points when we get the draft regulations into certain forms, we're going to have specific 
meetings to hear public feedback about them, and that schedule will be determined either uh, tomorrow or at the meeting next week, but before long. As soon as that um, schedule is available, uh, that will be widely publicized so people know when exactly they can, they can come in and be heard on the specifics of the, the draft regulations uh, to date. And as I said, any, any comments along the way, please feel free to, to be emailing them to us. We just can't take the time during the meetings to hear all of those. Um, as Mr. Musanti said, the website is full of documentation. In fact, it's being set up uh, like the select board packets. So it's terrific. You, you look at the meeting and you can look at all of the information. Um, so we're trying to make all of the, the same information that the group is using available to uh, anyone interested in the public, uh, just in our process or in commenting. Um, and um, I think that's all I have to add to that. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that, so thank you. Great. Okay. Uh, I did want to spend a moment uh, updating the board. Uh, uh, you had asked a while back now uh, about, uh, tell us about security details that some uh, residents or groups of residents in particular neighborhoods have uh, hired or are thinking of hiring and how do they interact, what's their role, how do they interact with the Amherst Police. Uh, we're aware of three neighborhood groups presently that have security, hired security uh, agencies a group in the Lincoln and Fearing Street areas, as well as uh, Coles Lane, um, Coles Lane, Hobart Lane area. Um, uh, Puffton and Townhouse also have private security uh, that uh, who are employees of those uh, uh, rental properties. Uh, most work uh, evenings, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, between 9 p.m. and 3 a.m. Um, there is regular dialogue between security uh, agencies and the Amherst Police, and that's strongly encouraged. Um, the Amherst PD meets regularly with uh, security personnel discussing appropriate protocols. Uh, there are written reports that are typically done by the agencies to their clients, which are the neighborhood groups in this case. Uh, again, with upfront communication, those are shared uh, regularly with the Amherst police. Um, the b bottom line on this is that they really try to act as the eyes and ears of residents, uh, looking at foot traffic, you know, large house parties, disturbances, <coughs> et cetera. Um, uh, patrol officers and the security agent agencies themselves are encouraged to have dialogue with each other. I have witnessed that on some of my ride-alongs with the Amherst Police, that there's a lot of, you know, hey, what's going on, updates that go on over the course of the evening or getting, uh, uh, notifying, hey, you might wanna, you know, we hear there might be a larger gathering at such and such an address, just keep an eye on that. It, but also making clear that they do not have police powers, these security agencies. That's an important distinction that both uh, residents and the agent agencies uh, need to know. Uh, they cannot act as a complainant for things like noise disturbances. They can alert uh, residents and the police about uh, potential uh, problem addresses over the course of their shifts. Um, and so there's an ongoing effort by uh, uh, Chief Livingstone and his uh, people to have that dialogue ongoing. If there are specific questions, certainly having people contact me or uh, Amherst, uh, the chief's office at the police department, if you want additional background, is, is entirely okay. Ms. Brewer. Right, I think, and, and maybe I don't wanna make safe and healthy neighborhoods encompass every possible thing we could ever think of, but um, perhaps particularly with, I'm so glad that students are gonna be able to be involved in that effort. Yeah. I know it's difficult to engage them in a big project <coughs> when they're busy with everything else they do. But um, I just wanna make sure that, that we're keeping the lines of communication open with the various groups that are working with student renters on campus and getting them educated about how to be a good renter, how to be a good neighbor, that they also understand the role of these security right. folks because it seems like if anything we will continue to have them for a while rather than not have them 
and just so that people understand what role they do play, that they're not, as it sounds like, they are not coming up and knocking on the door and saying, I'm going to call the police if you guys don't settle down, or I'm going to write to the landlord and say that you can't be here anymore because I hear you being noisy. It's it's not quite that strong of a position. Like you say, it's more of an eyes and ears thing. Right. It's a heads up to the police when something's happening around. It's a heads up to the property owners if there's a particular area that's an issue. But it's not, they're not complainants, I guess, like right. you, was the way you phrased it. And I think right. it's important for the students to not, not so that they disrespect them, so but so that they understand where they fit into the big picture. Thank you. Other questions or comments for Mr. Musanti? All right, moving along. Uh, next, I do want to spend a couple minutes uh, reviewing with you, as we typically do during December, uh, in the hours and minutes after the conclusion of town meeting, uh, get back to working with staff on uh, budget uh, proposals that I'll be submitting in a formal way for the next fiscal year that begins in July. I'll be submitting those on January 16th uh, to the Select Board and the Finance Committee. And I wanted to give you a little bit of an overview of kind of w what I'm thinking about at this point. It's very much uh, under development and, and it's a work in progress, which is normal for December. Um, but you know back in October with our traditional preliminary projections, uh, uh, Sandy Pooler, the finance director, was talking about this next cycle being hopefully more of a slow and steady uh, kind of a, a process. Um, and I think what we've been focusing on as we put together our budget proposals uh, uh, in a preliminary way for next year is really focusing on uh, making sure that we're budgeting uh, realistically for known costs. Uh, you know that the big picture as it stands now is that after years of cuts, uh, we think we might get, uh, you know, even a modest increase in state aid and then our, our allowable local revenue increase. And that uh, after we um, um, apply what we know are some of our fixed obligations are for next year, that leaves increases of roughly 3% on average available for town school library uh, that also assumes a capital budget increase in terms of a share of the levy going up uh, to seven percent of the levy from six and a half percent of the levy which is worth a couple hundred thousand um, so those are kind of the baseline assumptions um, so known costs uh, i want to start with uh, what has been a growing share of our budget although in the last couple of years has been more stable as you saw in that 10-year fiscal trend report back in October. Uh, health insurance, uh, back in October, we were talking about potentially a 2.5% uh, increase. Uh, I'm going to firm up a recommendation before January 16th, but it is quite possible I'll be able to recommend a second consecutive year of no premium increase. Um, the trends, knock wood, health claim trends, knock wood, continue to be favorable. Uh, that plus uh, uh, what's been done on moving the retired teachers onto the uh, town plans and there's a savings to most of them and a savings to the schools as a result uh, help so um, that is uh, different from October and it's a good thing it's a good news kind of category um, so I'll, I'll have something firmer as we get closer to January 16th but I wanted to put out that out there. Uh, there are other, are other insurance uh, items that we need to budget for every year, property casualty, liability, all kind of the basics. Uh, workers' comp, we're self-insured. Um, there'll be some modest increases there, but nothing, uh, nothing outrageous, but we just need to account for those. Um, I'm looking at things like uh, caseload on veteran services. Uh, we think um, you may, we may have a small increase there, and we're waiting to see what our cherry sheet state aid reimbursement, which is typically 75% of those costs eventually being reimbursed, um, whether that's affected uh, for the upcoming fiscal year. We're not gonna know that on January 16th, so I think I'm gonna go with what we know 
uh, on the uh, spending side on that. Um, we're looking at things like uh, human resources, uh, refocusing on things like uh, employee training, having a more uh, defined and systemic training protocol. So we, you'll see some specific recommendations on that, some of which have a cost uh, applied to it. Uh, more realistic uh, for our known costs, uh, solid waste on the enterprise fund side. Uh, it falls into that category. Uh, there are um, cost obligations. Uh, there's uh, very little uh, fund balance remaining in that account, and there's a cost of providing our existing uh, services at the transfer station, et cetera. That, so we'll be looking at, at uh, the fees for that with the goal of trying to have it be as close to uh, self-supporting as possible by the users of the service. Um, circling back to safe and healthy neighborhoods focus, you can expect to see specific recommendations in my inspection services budget proposal as we've, uh, uh, Rob Mora, our new building commissioner, has hit the ground running and has looked at restructuring the work day of staff, restructuring the workload, and then taking a look at what we're able to get to. In a, which is most things in a more timely and consistent way, uh, but looking at workload ahead on some of the baseline inspection needs that are out there in the community. Uh, there will not yet be ready specific recommendations related to inspection uh, um, services needs related to the safe and healthy neighborhoods, and that will be fleshed out as we get a little more specific about uh, quantity and timing and pace of the uh, inspection program that will be mapped out over the next three or four months in the form of a proposal. So um, you're not going to see the magic uh, proposal on January 16th because it's very much a work in progress. Um, but you can expect to see other, other uh, changes in, within inspection services that I think will be a further improvement to their ability to do what they need to do. Um, again, the thing that you probably just think about all the time is OPEB. Uh, I know one of your well, favorite subjects, uh, long-term liabilities. Again, as we're in a better position uh, to think about our long-term needs and, be and begin to deal with them, as town meeting did with the uh, extra state aid we received this year as kind of a down payment on OPEB, uh, there is no reason, we think, to wait on budgeting for OPEB-related costs uh, in our enterprise funds, most notably water and sewer, which is, uh, I forget what the percentage is, it's under 20% of our total obligation, but it's the share of the workforce. Um, we think we're in a position to begin meeting those long-term obligations uh, from water and sewer uh, rates, and you can expect to see uh, no or a very small increase in rates for water and sewer, which will be the second such year with that. Um, so I just wanted to give you a heads up. There'll be progress on OPEB uh, uh, in the budget. Um, I'm also working on some of our structural gaps, so-called, in the budget. Uh, for example, the fact that we have uh, essentially a one crew within the DPW that for many years now has been funded uh, by capital project monies, um, which is not a sustainable or a desirable strategy long term. It also provides the town and the DPW with a lot less flexibility about allocating those personnel uh, for more routine maintenance work because they're busy working on projects, which is paying their salary. Um, so we think with our green community status and the installation before the end of the fiscal year of LED efficient streetlights that will generate a lot of uh, electricity cost savings, I want to be able to reinvest those savings uh, against that structural gap. And that's kind of boring by itself, but the practical benefit is um, that will um, be able allow us more flexibility in reallocating those crews for things like potholes. So these kind of down week to week uh, 
issues. Um, so I, we, we're not going to get all the way there in one year, but we're going to be able to make decent progress on that, I think, given that we're still looking at an overall uh, uh, 3%. So there'll be many other specifics laid out as we get the, uh, the budget proposal fully fleshed out over the next few weeks. Uh, but those are some of the key ones uh, that I wanted to throw out there for you. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I'm sure we're all curious about, uh, are you making progress on the ability to uh, find funding to replace the loss of CDBG funds? And are you confident of being able to? Uh, it's a multi-part uh, problem and a multi-part answer that is in development. Um, um, we are very hopeful now to receive transi transition funding. That will be firmed up certainly before January 16th. That could give us as much as half of our block grant that we received in the current year. Um, we think that uh, between those dollars and uh, unobligated uh, monies, there's a portion of the block grant, for example, that goes to administrative uh, support. We think th there's a way to cobble funds together from the existing grant and, the, and any transition money uh, to have that not be an FY14 general fund budget problem. So that's good. Um, we're still working with DHCD and others about how the capital and um, social services agencies, monies, how fungible they are. Uh, we want to explore that, whether there's any flexibility there. Uh, typically, they're allocated on a percentage basis with caps. Um, so we're, we're taking a long look at that. So I don't have a specific uh, um, recommendation ready for you on that, but I am completely aware of the issue and will we'll be responsive to it. Thank you very much. Questions or comments from Mr. Musanti about any of the budget issues? No? None? Okay, I have to ask about the health insurance part, and I think we've touched on this before, um, but I don't recall the answer. So <coughs> obviously it's uh, incredibly good news to imagine that we might not need a uh, an increase in health insurance again. Um, presumably, you're also looking to the future and, and to the degree that you can project <coughs> for that fund for the future um, and thinking about the benefit of a small increase now, even if you don't totally need it, versus a larger increase in the future that just is um, it because these these same increases go to the employees and the retirees it's not just the town so to kind of manage the smoothness of that increase for them um yeah no we are painfully aware of that concept and painfully because we've we've lived it when uh rate increases you know many years ago were not adequate to meet what was clearly a trend not a not a uh, aberration um, but we're working now in an environment where the trust fund is in a much stronger position, so there is much more of a cushion, um, and it's, uh, we are getting regular uh, quarterly or more frequent updates from our uh, benefits consultant about trend or claims projections going out 18 months at a time. Um, so it's with that background um, that uh, we're, we're, we're moving toward a zero. It's, it's knowing we're not expecting, well, I shouldn't jinx it, you know. Uh, a year from now, we're looking at 10%. <coughs> I, mean, I can't predict the future, but so far, so good on the trends. Thank you. And, and I want to emphasize, and Select Board all knows this, of course, but um, just thank you and congratulations on what a success the turnaround of the Healthcare Trust Fund has been. Um, it is not the usual in any other community or industry or sector at all that the healthcare uh, uh, cost increases are being held at zero or close to zero for multiple years. And as you alluded to, this certainly was not the case a couple of years back when kind of the, the bad planning had us had us doing a lot of catch up and things were really out of whack. Um, but since then, this has been just an enormous success. And so I just want to make sure you recognize how how appreciated that is and the 
you know, we can't be complacent and take this for granted. That that really is yeah. that is some seriously uh, skillful management of a very expensive and complicated trust that is uh, that is keeping us in good shape. So that's that's fine work by you and your staff. Thank you. All right. Anything else on budget? So the part of why he's doing this is so that we don't get to January 16th and then throw him some big surprise like you didn't what or, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you told us what. And uh, so so this is an opportunity for feedback. So, Ms. Brewer. Um, yes, I think it would be a really useful chart of all the many charts we like to use in the finance committee report because it, it is huge. It, it figures into collective bargaining discussions. It figures into everybody looking at their own personal budget. You know, they think, oh my gosh, my property taxes are going up. My health assurance is going up, but the town is budgeting well enough that we're not having to suddenly leap like some private and other organizations are having to do. So I think the emphasis on that is good. Um, in terms of the solid waste enterprise fund, <coughs> I imagine there'll be lots of background material on this when we get to it, but I know that I'm, I'm sort of vaguely remembering this effort of the Recycling Refuse Committee trying to get their arms around what might people be willing to do, what might they be willing to pay for. You know, to throw my personal anecdote in there, I haven't bought a sticker this year because I decided I didn't really need to go to the take it or leave it just to pay that money to go for a sticker, but I just depend on my private hauler for all my recycling needs. But I know that there are people who depend on being able to get rid of their trash there and being able to get rid of their recycling there. So, I mean, at what point does it just become, you know, I guess I'm trying to get a sense of, of how significant this is because you know seventy dollars for a sticker that can't be transferred from one car to another is already expensive and that doesn't even give you the ability to throw any trash away. So at what point is it a service you know for ten people versus is it a service for three hundred or four hundred people? Yeah. Um, how do we make that? I spent part of my day uh, in the gory details of solid waste management <laughs> with staff today. Uh, I know there were somewhere around 2,000 uh, uh, people or businesses in town who have the stickers for solid waste. Um, so that $75 a year fee, and then there's a per bag fee with right. you know bulky items have a slot have different scale to it, and the uh, commercial stickers are per vehicle, and it's a uh, a larger amount than that. Um, so we're looking at specifics. That'll be refined for January. Um, keeping in mind that there's a cost to providing the baseline <coughs> services. So the recommendation isn't going to be, you know, it's going to be um, close to a status quo service level budget because there's all these other things playing out, including, okay, what's the long-term future? Should we stay in the transfer station business? What about other recycling initiatives and how might they be organized or paid for? Um, that's not ready for January or even July, but it's a big to-do item that is well down the field. But um, the fee levels are being looked at in the context of uh, the contrasting that with what the cost of uh, curbside pickup and recycling are. You know, for the average family, it's $400 or more, depending on the volume of how many barrels and all that stuff. Um, so it's in that vein that, uh, that an adjustment would be considered that it's still meant to appeal to the do-it-yourselfers and those looking to save some money. Um, so that'll be the context, but there's also a gap between what they are now and uh, what the cost is of, of keeping it afloat. Because, because, and without wanting to get into the huge discussion of it, um, in terms of structurally, I think it's one of the areas where we look at what is the point of providing the service, because right. is the town's job to provide a lower cost alternative for people to get rid of their trash? when we have to have the overhead of having people there, blah, 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 like you say, these various things down the field. And so I think just, you know, as we explain it to people going forward, that it isn't just we're trying to recoup costs, but we also are evaluating whether or not this is a service, you know, just like we don't have a leaf vacuum anymore. This is the kind of right. thing we are going to be able to continue to do just because costs have, have gone up so much. So thank you. Yeah, and I think in the interim, you know, to the extent we're going to stay in that business, which may be a long-term thing, don't get me wrong, because those recommendations aren't ready yet, 
the pricing should be reflecting what it costs. Right. And so that's that's the analysis that's being updated now. Other questions or comments? Ms. Stein. Um, what I was going to, I was expecting you to say something about the reduced um, revenue that the state is experiencing and giving us really bad news. <laughs> so this is relatively optimistic. I wondered if you want to say whether you think that local aid will be, which is always a worry. <laughs> uh, again, I cannot predict the future guarantee the future, I'd be in a different line of work, uh, probably. Um, all of us have been doing this for a while in different capacities. Um, it's not unusual that there's a lowering of expectations kind of language that goes on this time of year. Okay. Um, having said that, um, the year-to-date revenue at the state level is below their budgeted uh, revenue um, and the question is is that a trend or is it temporary what it, what is it and if so what what does that portend for next year our existing projections uh, we haven't really changed since October which was basically level funded state aid with a very tiny incremental uh, chapter 70 uh, education aid increase uh, I don't see my recommendation changing before the governor's proposal comes out at the very end of January. Um, I have a hard time believing there will be a reduction. It really remains to be seen what's the magnitude of any increase. And you know, I guess I'm less optimistic than October because of that more recent news, but I, I just don't see it being a cut. I really don't at this point, but that we'll see. Yeah. Well, maybe they'll even yeah. increase taxes for some of the areas of the budget at the state level that have big holes, like the transportation sector. We'll see. Ms. Poor. As a preview, I guess, to an upcoming BCG meeting, um, I guess we'll hear there where um, the schools stand in terms of their grants, just as we what you're tr yes. trying to accommodate with our block grant loss. They were also looking at some potential losses just to ensure that if somehow that's being accommodated in a way that needs to be done without throwing all our percentages and pie pieces and everything off. Other questions or comments? Um, I'll just note that uh, I, I think the, the part about using the energy savings from the new lights to um, make more efficient and practical how we fund our DPW folks is fantastic. And um, I think that that would be a really great thing to explain in detail in sure. the uh, in the budget report, uh, in, in your budget to us and, and also. Cover memo. <laughs> because, um, you know, we talk about this project work, like, you know, most people have no idea what that means. And to the degree that that is really a, a big impact on how come our potholes are in such a terrible condition now. People would like to know that there's a real cause and effect there and that there is a uh, specific steps are being taken to remedy it. And I would really love if, if we could in that report have kind of some history on how that happened. What, what was the decision that got made that that put the that staff funding in that peculiar category did it have a benefit was that a good idea uh was it a good idea at the time and it only has played out badly like eventually or uh, or what but it would be good to know how that happened um and when and if we're doing anything else weird like this now such that we might want to worry about it uh, and also, I think the OPEB, the idea of being able to uh, deal with some of the OPEB obligations from the enterprise funds, that's, that's uh, like painless and just seems so um, practical. And I, I, I think that's brilliant. So I'm, I'm happy to hear all of that. All right, we're ready to move on from this. Okay, did you have any recent and upcoming stuff you wanted to talk about? Uh, yeah, again, real quick, uh, there is tree work that is beginning this month on the notch related to the next state project, uh, uh, which are uh, long planned for and uh, now funded improvements to the roadway in 116 through the notch. Um, but there's um, 
some tree clearing that's going that will be going on on the state job. Uh, uh, state officials, along with Mr. Zomack, Mr. Mooring, have come in and briefed the Public Shade Tree Committee recently. Com Comscom has been in the loop on that. Just wanted you and the public to be aware that you'll see activity out there. The good news is that it's not related to the Atkins Corner work, but it's it was planned as a coordinated effort uh, with the Atkins Corner work to uh, make that ro stretch of road uh, on the southern tip of the town uh, safer. Um, next, uh, uh, there'll be a uh, ceremony press conference, uh, if you will, this Wednesday morning, the 5th at 11 a.m. Uh, with the uh, uh, Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs, uh, Secretary Rick Sullivan and his sta key staff will be here. They'll be announcing uh, 13 uh, land grants. And I can tell you that uh, we are uh, uh, going to be receiving one of them. Uh, we'll get those details on Wednesday. Uh, so very pleased to host that. Um, and there'll be other communities, and you're certainly encouraged. And uh, we've asked uh, key uh, <coughs> members of staff and boards, et cetera, to also attend. Uh, so we're excited about that. That's Wednesday morning. We did receive word, uh, if you remember, there were a couple of items funded, recommended by the uh, Community Preservation Act Committee in Article 8 of the November 19th town meeting. Uh, one of those was for, for improvements on the North Common uh, directly in front of Town Hall. We did receive word from the same agency uh, that we did not receive that grant. So we were not like shocked by that, but we were disappointed. Uh, they did tell us that was a very competitive application, strongly encouraged us to uh, reapply uh, next year. That would have been the second consecutive year we received a park grant, Parks and Recreation uh, Improvements grant uh, after getting a grant last year for Wool Memorial Pool. Um, they strongly encouraged us to reapply, and they said that while it was a strong application, it could be even stronger with some additional uh, community input. So we've had some, uh, so I've uh, directed staff to uh, think about how we would solicit that uh, additional feedback, knowing that it would be a design build grant anyways. That we're being told, look, it would be even stronger if there was a more specific reference to community feedback on that. So we're gonna pursue that. Uh, I've asked staff to reapply that article was contingent on the grant award, which didn't happen in this case. I've asked staff to reapply for CPA money through the CPAC process that's beginning in about a week. <laughs> uh, so that's- This week. Park grant. Um, um, Ms. Stein, question? Uh, um, I was wondering when you resubmit uh, or reapply for the park grant for the North Common, when is that due? Uh, the deadline is, I believe, June or July. Okay. So the timing would work out fine because in this scenario with additional community feedback and ideally uh, CPAC recommendation and town meeting funding in place at the time of the application, that would be another positive for that application. Okay. Other questions or comments from Mr. Musanti? All right, then thank you very much. Moving on, member reports. Liaison and representative reports. We have not done this for about a month because uh, we've been at town meeting since then. So do you have liaison reports? Ms. Stein. Um, the Board of Health met <coughs> November 29th and approved uh, drinking water regulations, which were requested by the Department of Environmental Protection, and Mr. Morin came and spoke about them, and they have been completed. Amherst has rejoined the Public Health Emergency Coalition. Um, the Cambodian Outreach Worker <coughs> Funds dried up, so at the moment, we don't have a 
Cambodian outreach worker, but we hope that there will be funds somehow, <laughs> sooner or later. Um, UMass is going smoke-free in 2013, which I think is very interesting. And then I also attended the personnel board meeting, which was on November 28th, the day before. And the um, UN Resources um, group under Deb Radway are thinking about reorganization. And there was discussion of exit interviews, which I got to read one, and they're extremely informative about how a particular department is functioning and what the stresses might be within the department and what the kudos to that department should be. So it, they're extremely valuable. I had no idea how valuable an excerpt interview could be until I got to read one. So that's all I have to say. Um, those are my two liaison reports. Thank you. Mr. Mercedes, could you comment about the Cambodian outreach worker situation? Yeah, that for many years has been funded through uh, grants from a Hartford-based uh, agency, Khmer Health Associates, and they've been relying on federal monies. Uh, and after many, many years, their funding uh, was not renewed. And so uh, they're still making efforts, working with our health director to try to identify alternative funding. But this has been uh, kind of an unfolding thing over the last several months and uh, as of now uh, there is no alternative funding and it, doesn't the town match those funds uh, we've been we've been uh, providing uh, the benefit costs the and the grant was paying for the uh, hours worked Ms. Poor. I just I regret that I don't remember more of the details. Obviously, town manager does, but I know that this was a point of contention for people a couple of years ago at town meeting, that this was a particular concern. Years ago, we used to share one with the schools. I don't know if they have any relationship, if there's still that coordination between health and schools associated with that. But to have this just kind of disappear mid-year feels off. In term, I mean, it's the reality, but at the same time, it seems as though we need to do, not to necessarily immediately say, oh, well, I guess we'll have to stop doing something else to pay for this. But it's not, it, given that it's been a point of contention in the past, I think it's a bit of a problem to just leave it lay there. So I'm, I'm wondering well, what we can do. There's been exhaustive well, uh, discussion like and attempts with yeah. schools and other community groups about alternative models or funding models uh, that, that will continue so far. Uh, one has not been identified that works for all parties. Still working on it. Okay. Other questions or comments? Oh, oh that was for Ms. Stein's liaison report. Okay. Uh, any other liaison representative reports? Okay. I hate to do this to you, but I've got a few. Um, <laughs> so, a Council on Aging, which I finally got to after many, many absences. Um, I wanted to just give you a couple updates on things I think you need to know. One of them is their parking pilot program that they had brought to us a while back. Um, the pilot is now over. It's been very successful. Um, they would like to make a few tweaks to it, um, and I'm going to get them scheduled pretty soon to come and give us an update on all of that. Um, so there's that. Also related to transportation, uh, this is just kind of a shout out to the Friends of the Amherst Senior Center that has just recently purchased for the Senior Center a 2010 Dodge Caravan. This is a seven passenger van. Senior Center for a while has had a, uh, like a small bus um, that, that they bought, I don't know, years ago. But the problem is you need a commercial driver's license to drive it so they can only use it when they can get a commercial driver. Um, and they've had great cooperation from the schools and stuff on that. But um, this really increases their options to have a seven passenger van. This was bought by the Friends of the Senior Center. This is the uh, nonprofit that Town Meeting voted to form just a couple of years ago to, in order them, uh, to enable them to raise funds to support the Senior Center. So this is a great, really concrete, very practical way for them to support the senior center. And what they've done is they've donated the van to the town, and the town will pay its insurance and maintenance. But uh, but the vehicle was purchased by them, so that is terrific. Um, 
Community Innovation Challenge Grant uh, and Regionalization. The Senior Center is like the Regional School District Planning Committee and others, I understand, because it's a very big grant program, is seeking a Community Innovation Challenge Grant, and they are looking to do it on the basis of uh, essentially trying to regionalize or increase regionalization options with Pelham for senior services. A lot of folks from Pelham already attend the Senior Center, but there are various Amherst-specific programs like <coughs> the uh, are you okay? Uh, uh, emergency calls from the police station, um, the uh, SALT Council, things like that, various things that Pelham folks might be able to participate in also, so, uh, so they are pursuing that. I can just give you a sure. quick update on that. I know that I mean, there are some other issues that need to be worked out, so I know that uh, they did not apply for the uh, Senior Services Challenge Grant by the November 30th deadline, but there'll be, there's ongoing dialogue with staff and with Pelham about how we might better collaborate in the future that works for all parties. Thank you. So, never mind about that part. That's, um, no, that's a good one. <laughs> um, another thing relevant to us is um, raking, uh, raking leaves is always a big deal for senior citizens and they, they try and get volunteers <coughs> to, um, to do this and match match the needs of folks who, who, particularly if you can't afford to hire somebody to do it for you, then what do you do? Um, and the select board's coffee hour, which unfortunately I was not able to be at, that was right after my father's accident, um, it was a great source of volunteer contacts. So all kinds of volunteer groups, student groups came forward to assist with that. So I just wanted to let you folks know that, uh, that the, that coffee hour was very helpful uh, in that regard. And that's exactly what we're trying to do with that, really bu building bridges between the students and the uh, and town government. So there's a perfect example. Okay, in a little bit more detail, or a little bit longer, I'll try and be quicker actually, but um, Campus and Community Coalition. Of course, this is how I spend my life, right? So the uh, this group has been, we've been trying to identify not just our strategic plan for the future, but really specific goals for this year. and. Um, so some of us have been meeting kind of in smaller groups to do this and, and what we want to do is be not just kind of, you know, the, the pie in the sky, like high level stuff. We want to be talking about real deliverables. Um, so we are concentrating our work for spring in just a couple of key areas. Um, we, we talked about, okay, we've done all of this work. We've got all of this outreach happening. We've got all this coordination happening, all kinds of good messaging, blah, blah, blah. But we've got ongoing problems, the ongoing problems, and, and we talked about what those were. And, and as we talked about everything, we really came down to the fact that they are primarily disruptive parties and I emphasize the disruptive because parties that aren't disruptive are not a problem. Um, the walking around between parties that happens, kind of these roving bands that we talk about, um, which sometimes become parties in themselves, but they certainly have a bunch of negative impacts as far as noise, litter, you know, all kinds of things. Um, and something called pre-gaming, which is a, a growing problem, and this is um, young people drinking typically in their dorms before they leave, uh, and what they what the the impacts that has among the impacts that has is they typically do that in a very short period of time. They ingest a whole bunch of alcohol um, because they're going out and they know that they can't get into the bars. Uh, they won't be able to be served downtown. They get to a party. They may or may not be able to be served at a party. So they're trying to make sure that they have plenty of alcohol in them before they go out. So this has this has many different problems. It, it, it uh, contributes to the disruption of parties. It contributes to the this walking around group problem when these kids are all uh, intoxicated. It has a very big impact on our ambulance response situation. Um, it has a big impact uh, related to the ambulance response at things like Mullen Center events and other on-campus events where, again, the students know that they're not going to be able to drink. Um, so trying to discourage pre-gaming is another way that we're, uh, that we're trying to direct our efforts. Um, and so when we talked about how to do this, we said, all right, so part of all of these issues is communication. It's about the messaging, the information, making sure people understand a, a bunch of information related to, to these issues. Some of it's town bylaw stuff, some of it's code of student conduct stuff, it's all kinds of things. Um, so that's a component of, of all of these parts. 
but then what are the other components? So what we've done is we've set ourselves up into four working groups. One of them is going to concentrate on the communication part of it. The others are going to concentrate on specifically the disruptive parties. What else is it that makes these things disruptive and how, what do you do about it? And so among the things we talk about there is um, um, when parties go viral, this is the whole social media thing. So you invite you know, 10 of your closest friends and somebody tweets about it or texts their friends about it, that gets passed around the world. Next time you know there are 300 people you don't know at your party, that's a really big deal. Um, so they're gonna, they're gonna be looking at specific things like that. How do you prevent that? What do you do about <coughs> it? Um, and they're going to make recommendations on, on strategies to deal with that. Uh, the walking around group, again, what are the causes and effects of these roving bands of students kind of going from place to place, being noisy, et cetera, um, and brainstorm on how to, how to diminish those causes and diminish the negative impacts, uh, and obviously the pre-gaming as I talked about. Um, so uh, this is another group with a really ambitious schedule. We've set the end of January for all, each of these subgroups to bring back recommendations that we can then try and massage and really make actionable for the spring um, to make, uh, to make the, uh, the coalitions group extremely um, concrete and, and practical for what we're doing right now because really we are doing all this work. We've got all these great resources, a bunch of great people at the table. Um, so we're trying to focus on what are, what continue to be the weak points and the vulnerabilities. So you'll be hearing a lot more about that. Um, related to that, we're also looking at um, that group and others are looking at party registration. And we had last week, we um, uh, many of us attended a webinar, uh, a web seminar from a group in Fort Collins, Colorado that uh, at Colorado State University is there and uh, they do a party registration system which it's kind of complicated and various schools do it various ways across the country and so it would take a lot of homework and research but um, but kind of in a nutshell what they're doing in Fort Collins is in return for the students registering their parties, the point of registering is that a, they then get a bunch of information about how to be responsible in the party that they have uh, registered, and B, if they've registered their party, what that equals for them is if somebody calls with a complaint about the party, dispatch at the police station would call that party host, the person who's listed as the contact on the registration, and say, okay, you've got 20 minutes to shut this down. Uh, either shut it down or you know seriously reduce the noise or whatever. Um, if we get another call after 20 minutes that things are still noisy there, then the police are going to come. And so the benefits of this are the students when they were talking about um, you know all kinds of students say, well if if the neighbors just told us if we just knew we were too loud we would have stopped. You know it's too bad we had to get arrested or we had to get a big fine or whatever to to learn that if we just knew. So. So this is a system that they worked out and said, okay, here's your warning. And if, if that doesn't work, then we all agree that you're, you're going to get the fine. Sometimes you're still going to get the fine. I mean, if it's totally egregious and, you know, the, the cops can hear you three blocks away or, you know, all kinds of things. It, it's not a get out of jail free card and it does not in any way guarantee that these students wouldn't get, uh, uh, these party hosts wouldn't get a fine. But it's a way of, of um, helping to prevent that. On the police side, the appeal is that they, in a college town like ours, they have all kinds of high priorities, all kinds of calls they need to respond to. Noise complaints are not at the top of their list. I mean, they're dealing with domestic violence. All kinds of very serious issues are happening. Um, so they can't always get to a party call as quickly as they want to. So, you know, just like here, you've got long, long wait times for the responses. This drastically cuts down on where the police need to respond. So the police appreciate it because it helps them to better uh, stretch out their limited resources. So, so far it's, it's been a very successful situation for them. It doesn't eliminate the parties, doesn't eliminate the tickets, anything like that, but it has struck a real balance that has, um, has been beneficial for, for all involved. So th these are the kinds of things when we talk about, you know, best practices in other communities and everything, like we're looking at this, uh, at all of these issues from all of these different ways, and, um, and this is just another, another thing that's on the horizon and under consideration, so I just wanted folks to know about that questions or comments. Ms. Burr. How does keg registration 
fit in with that and it just in terms of your experiences thus far and having these conversations because keg registration is kind of this just this odd little thing we've got off on the side that people don't grasp they don't know why they're doing it blah 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 so I, does it fit into that as well is it kind of another variation on that um the I, so I wasn't around for when keg registration was created. We did boost the fines for that to $300 like everything else a couple of years ago. Um, my understanding from students is that they basically don't bother to get kegs right. anymore because you don't want to be telling the police department where your parties are. Right. Um, and I don't, I'm not aware that we get too many unregistered keg violations. Um, what the, and we don't, yeah, um, what, the Fort Collins folks say, and again, th there's every flavor of this, and just because they do it one way doesn't mean that we would have to do it this way if we went down this road at all, but um, the police don't get the list of parties. They specifically don't. So it's not like the police are driving around looking for the parties, because that was kind of the first reaction of the students. Why the heck would I flag my party for the police? But the police have better things to do than go around and look for parties. Um, but the dispatch officer has them. And so it's something to check against. So once you get a noise violation, you say a, a noise complaint call, you look at the list and say, okay, is this on the list of, of registered? If not, then it just becomes another police call. They just let the police know you've got a noise complaint on you know, Elm Street and go check it out. If that's a registered party, then before the dispatcher does that, they call the host and they say, listen, your party that's registered here, we've gotten a noise complaint, you know, consider this your warning, here's your grace period. If, if we get another call after that grace period, then the, the, the police are, are gonna come out. So, uh, so it's a cool. very interesting concept and, uh, and we'll be looking at it even more. Anything else? Okay, anybody else have ladies on reports? Ms. Brewer. You mentioned the coffee hour. Could we, and, and that there was obviously much confusion around that time because we missed you so desperately when you were away, but we still need the sheet of the contacts. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, it's out there. <laughs> Sounds like senior senate. Council got on Aging got what they annual report. <laughs> hey, that's a great. I got this list. And I mean, it shouldn't be your problem, but it is just one of the things on the list because it is awfully nice to remind ourselves, especially since you see a lot more of these people on a regular basis than we do, but if we can remind ourselves, oh yeah, that's who that person was who I said could talk to so-and-so about that thing. Thank you, yeah, so <laughs> yeah, it is on my list. I hope to get oh, it to you before, awesome. two, before next year's coffee well, hour. Uh, in the meantime, you. if there's anyone you want to contact, let me know, I'll put you in touch. <laughs> okay. okay, anybody else right. for liaison reports? If nobody else has yeah. a liaison report, may I ask a quick town manager? question sure and that is in regards to and it, you know email is great but then you sometimes forget to bring it up in public as well which is that the parking the free parking has been awesome so far as I understand it and it was great having the little bid elves give out uh, <laughs> brownies on Saturday wow. during the snow it was quite lovely um, however had not realized had not noticed had forgotten whatever a few people noticed that the bag said two hour limit. And that's not what we actually voted on. Yes, they're normally two hour meters, et cetera. So what I would just like to know is that at some point in the future that we would, um, y'all can just do this and let us know how it works out. Um, talk to the chamber, talk to the bid to say, you know, did, did customers have any complaints? I mean, there were some vendors that were concerned at a particular fair that was taking place at the Unitarian because they just didn't, they were just worried because, you know, vendors always worry because they never know where they're supposed to park at any given event. Um, if it actually became a problem for any customers, I'm assuming we didn't actually chalk tires or anything, which we don't normally do anyway, but we didn't try and enforce the two hours and that nobody got tickets for that. Um, but just so that we all have a shared understanding next year of how it's supposed to work and so that people know that, yes, those are not, if we continue to do it the way we are doing it, to say, yes, it's two hour parking, we're not enforcing the two hour limit, but obviously we would like it to turn over because that's what you do on a downtown kind of thing. But just so everybody's clear on what it is, but just to make sure there weren't any particular concerns that arose from <coughs> when you're having your usual conversations with parking and chamber and bid people, it'd be useful to hear back. I'm, ha I'm happy to do that. And At some point. Um, Mr. Eden. I have a quick question. How many of those bags are left? 
Oh, you don't need to get back to you on that. Uh, I'm just I'm just wondering <laughs> if um, they they aren't left over left over stock, and that's why they got well, used. Well, can, can I just say the 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 clear advice and commitment is follow up on this. Uh, <laughs> the, the holiday parking, uh, you know, incentives that the board has voted in various ways over the years is related to the cost of parking. Not that every other parking regulation uh, is, you know, temporarily taken out of context. So I think whenever those bags were purchased, which was a number of years ago, I don't know when, um, the encouragement was free parking and making it clear that it was free parking, but also in a hopefully friendly, customer friendly <coughs> kind of way with the holiday colors on the bags and everything else that it's a, a prime on street space and it's encouraged for turnover, which was the whole point was to get more customers, customers right. and visitors into the downtown uh, during the holiday season. So that I suspect was a motivation behind putting the two hour reminder on the bag itself versus an all day pass to right. shuttle over to campus or whatever. So the, the larger point, I think Ms. Brewer's point, is the shared expectation, just so we right. know. It either it either is for two hours or it isn't for two hours, and so when we make the vote that we know and we then discuss it appropriately. Yep. Okay. Good. Absolutely. Uh, anything else on liaison? I remember. Okay, I don't have anything for chair report, <coughs> calendar preview. We have one more meeting this year. At that meeting, we will have a... Uh, Liquor license hearing for the alteration of premises for Mission Cantina. Hooray, they're expanding. Um, <laughs> and uh, we will have an update from the town manager, uh, a progress report on goals to date. Um, and there will be a bunch of other things, I'm sure, that happens between now and then, but that is our last one of the year, which will be very nice. Uh, and then we start meeting again in January. Um, if you have things that need to happen, I, I can't remember it at the moment when our first January meeting is. I think it's the second week of January, so that's going to be several weeks between meetings. So do be do be thinking about anything that might be time sensitive between that time and try and try and uh, front load those to me so we we get them onto the agenda for next time. All right. If there is nothing else, then I will make the executive session motion. Okay, I was <laughs> going to move to adjourn to a special to a executive yeah. session. Yeah, I'll let you do that. You don't mind my making this. All right. So um, I move to enter executive session per Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 30A, Section 21, Part A, Subset 3, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining. An open meeting, uh, as an open meeting, may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining position of the public body and the select board will not return to public session at the conclusion of executive session. Brewer, aye. Aye, <laughs> aye. O'Keefe, aye. Bald, aye. Hayden, uh, aye. Thank you. Then, uh, without objection, this meeting adjourns to executive session at 8.57, and again, will not reconvene publicly, so we will see you all again on Monday, December 17th. Thank you very much.